2017. My name is John Michael. I work with the Metro Codes Department, and I'll be presenting each of the cases to the board today for their review. As we begin the meeting, we would respectfully ask if uh, members of the audience would please silence your phones, silence your tablets, silence any other electronic equipment, just so that the presentations are not interrupted and the board's deliberation is not interrupted. And of course, we thank you in advance for your help with that. In each of today's public hearings, the board will review the correspondence that's been submitted in support of and opposition to each of the cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies and even elected officials for each of these cases. In today's hearings, the staff will present the site plans, the maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of staff's presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board would then hear from any of those wishing to speak in support of the case in question. After supporters have spoken, if there is in fact opposition, then the opposition would have its opportunity to present their testimony. The appellant then would have an opportunity for rebuttal after the presentation of any opposition. It's noteworthy for attendees today that under BZA rules, the appellant has 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board if there's no opposition present. However, in contested cases, BZA rules allow 15 minutes for each side to present the desired testimony. Should an appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the originally allotted 15 minutes. Of note, this is 15 collective minutes. Therefore, if you have 100 people who wish to speak in support of a case, you need to figure out a way to divvy up your 15 minutes into equal hundredths pieces, I suppose. Same for the opposition. At the conclusion of each hearing, our board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board's vested with the power to act on these cases, pursuant to the Metro Zoning Code, section 17.40.1. 80. All of the sections from the Metropolitan Code of Laws that we refer to today actually come from the Zoning Code. The Metro Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January the 1st, 1998. I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The code requires a record of our proceedings because the BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network and also uploaded to YouTube at a later date. It is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board please come forward to the front table, identify yourself by name and address, and make the desired presentation. The Metro Code requires that we have at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that only four board members are present and the appeal fails to obtain the four affirmative votes, the appeal will be re-advertised for our next hearing date. In the event that five or more members are present and the appeal fails to obtain the four needed affirmative votes, the case would remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal a board decision to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing within that same 60-day window, pursuant to the terms of the BZA rules and regulations. After that time elapsed, um, the board's decision becomes final. No further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you're required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years in order for the board approval to remain valid. It should be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, then any approval granted by the board could be rescinded at a later date means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, and submit that all of our cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Uh, as in a preliminary announcement for the board, I will note that the very last case on your docket, case number 168, has been deferred to August the 3rd, 2017, the first meeting in August for this board. Therefore, that case will not be heard today. That is the case on Woodmont Boulevard, 2318 Woodmont. So if anyone is here for that particular case, um, that will not be held and heard until when? August the 3rd. August 3rd, okay. And Mr. Chairman, this is the point of the meeting where we typically like to recognize the elected officials who are present yes. with us. And before we start that, I would like to recognize uh, a member of our state legislature, uh, if he wants to come forward, uh, Harold Love. Are you here to speak on behalf of something? Representative Love? Are you, are you here to I know that on? Representative Love is here for a case that has been moved from today's docket. It was originally scheduled to be heard, an item on Buchanan, and it's not going to be heard today, and it's not on the final docket, but will be heard at a later date. So as uh, Representative Love and I spoke earlier, okay. we appreciate him being here and showing an interest for the benefit of his community, of course. Thank you for being here, Representative Love, and uh, we're honored that you're here today. Yes. 
Mr. Chairman, there are three Metro Council members with us as well today to address certain cases on your docket. We'll give them the opportunity to come forward and address the board at this time if they wish. Uh, first that I spoke with today was Council Member Jeff Syracuse. Councilman, do you wish to address the board here at the outset of the meeting or wish to wait until the case comes up? And my question will go unanswered as the okay. Council Member has stepped out for a brief moment. Um, with that, Council Member Brett Withers. Councilman Withers, do you wish to address the board? Yes, please. Very well. Councilman Withers, welcome back to the VZA. Uh, so which cases are you speaking on behalf I have, of today? Thank you so much, Mr. Ewing. I have, uh, there are two District 6 cases on today's agenda. The first one is case 2017-151, which is for property located at 1621 Holly Street. When I was at the last uh, meeting, there were several short-term rental related items on the agenda, and I commented at that time that I had not, not had contact with mm -hmm. or from any of those appellants uh, at that time and requested deferral. This one apparently would have been deferred. Unfortunately, I still have had no con contact from that appellant. And so if the appellant's here today, I'd be happy to maybe speak with her afterward. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, I, I simply have no information from which to support an appeal. John Michael, is that person here today? They would have to be. I believe that was Ms. Devane's case at 1621 Holly. Is Ms. Devane present? It appears that she is not, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We'll continue. Um, then the second case that I'm here for today is case 2017-152, which is for property located at 603 South 20th Street. Um, the appellant was here at the last hearing, had reached out to me, which is always helpful to me, um, and had uh, sent out uh, mailers to neighbors with some information um, and about the proposal at the last uh, hearing I requested, and the appellant uh, graciously agreed to a deferral in order to to make an appearance before the Shelby Hills Neighborhood Association meeting. Um, I ended up not being able to participate in that meeting myself due to budgetary hearings running late. Um, but the information that I've received from uh, from neighbors is that it, it's unfortunately the case we have not reached uh, agreement. Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing a, a clear path forward at this moment for uh, community support for the variance requests that are submitted, at least as submitted. Um, there are some concerns that neighbors have raised that I believe could be addressed uh, if the if it were to please the board to add some conditions to your mm -hmm. approval in your order and I'm happy to suggest those but really uh, what were the suggestions that you heard from the neighbors and with these conditions would they get your approval for this particular variance request they are this request is for uh, request setback variances mm -hmm. on three sides of the property yes. um, the neighbors who have been uh, speaking or writing about the case primarily um, are impacted by access to the alley at the south side of the property and there are some conditions that could potentially mitigate at least that particular side of the property um, however there are um, again I, I sort of struggle with with a, I, I want to work with a property owner who has a buildable lot I think that the dimensions of the lot uh, present uh, item A characteristics that are that are unique hardships that follow the land and, and not the actions of the, the appellant. I do struggle with granting a, a setback variance on three sides uh, of a property, however. Um, so again, for the for the twentieth street or for the alley side um, with with access concerns from the neighbors that share that alley. Is the which alley is the it? rear setback? The alley uh, it the building as proposed uh, meets a the existing setbacks for along the alley for 10 feet. Okay. But um, the alley is shared by a, a small number of, of homes, but it is a, a dead end alley, unfortunately, dead end into, into Shelby Park. And so there are some things that I, I think the board could rule on to mitigate that particular concern. Mm -hmm. um, those would be, um, in this particular case, to require that access to the property, which would be driveway access, be off of 20th Street itself and not off of the alley. Um, that would be one thing that might have to mitigate that to an extent. Um, I believe the appellant has uh, indicated that they are not planning on installing a fence along the alley, but if, if it's possible to add into the order that no fence should be constructed along the alley, that might help with some of those visibility concerns. I would suggest that garbage and recycling continue to be picked up in the alley along with everyone else's, but I, I do get the concern about driveway access. 
Um, at the last hearing, the appellant was willing to agree to limiting the height of the structure to no more than two stories or 35 feet in height. Um, one of the things that neighbors have raised that uh, is, is a major concern in, in this particular neighborhood. This is sort of ground zero for the tree protection uh, efforts that are underway in our city. Um, neighbors are concerned that uh, by allowing that many uh, setback variances on that property that there is no feasible way to be in compliance with the Metro Tree Code. And so that, again, is where I would really encourage the board to look at that site plan a little bit more closely and determine whether that uh, having that much building area um, covered actually allows for compliance with other parts of the Metro Code. I would also say that the front setback request along South 20th Street would potentially make it impossible if Metro were ever to seek to add sidewalks. Okay. So th again, there are there are some conditions I think that would mitigate some of the concerns yeah, from the alley we'll access side, but at this point in time, I've not seen uh, uh, any middle ground that we've reached, and so I can't support the, the the request as submitted today. Does anyone have any additional questions for Councilman Withers on this particular property? We appreciate you being here, and we know it's a busy time with um, your budget getting passed recently and the Hot Chicken Festival. Hot Chicken so Festival, yeah. Well done. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined today by the District Council Member from District 16, uh, Councilman Freeman. Did you wish to address the board at this time? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, board. Uh, I'll be brief this time, not nearly as long and drawn out as the last. But, uh, we've got two cases. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is 165, which is on consent, just a setback. Um, no one's reached out to me either for or against. So if we're just talking about building a porch, a front porch on their house, I'd love to have a front porch on mine. So <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, on the case of 113, I think we'd like to uh, take that up at the time of the hearing. Okay. Very good. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. Our board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases where the appellants have essentially met all the criteria needed in order to gain approval from this board. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts, then that case is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been recommended for such today. And if anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases identified, please indicate as much by raising your hand, make sure that I see you, so that we can remove that case from the consent agenda and then hear it in its regular order. The first case recommended for the consent agenda is case number 2017-165. This is involving the property at 69 J Street in Council District number 16, a request for a variance from street setback requirements in order to construct a front porch addition. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 165? Seeing none. The second case recommended for the consent agenda is 2017-167. Involving the property at 1041A East Trinity Lane in Council District Number 5, a request for a variance from landscape buffer requirements to reduce down to a 5-foot landscape buffer for a 100-foot frontage of the property. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 167? Seeing none. Mr. Chairman, these are our only two cases on the consent agenda today. We would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Okay. Uh, those two cases have been moved to the... Yes. On East Trinity Lane? Yes. yes. Okay. We'll remove that in here in its regular order, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Very good. Leaving case 165 for consent. So that only leaves case 165 for the consent agenda. So 165, the one on J Street. So I'll second that. Okay. The motion's been made, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? John Michael. And in the interim, we also, uh, Councilman Jeff Syracuse from HIP Donaldson is in the back of the room, so if he wants to. Councilman, if you would like to address the board at this point, very well. He chooses to wait until his case comes okay. up, Mr. Chairman. And with that, the appellant on case number 165, your case has been granted. You will be able to come into the codes department as early as Monday and obtain the permit that you have sought with your case. Good luck to you. And Mr. Chairman, with that, we'll take up uh, John, some early cases. John Michael, um, I know the planning department has given 
us new information on sidewalks and the head of planning, Doug Sloan, is here with his staff. And I know we have some cases involving sidewalks. If it would please the board, I would like for us to take them all at once and take them quickly at first. And for the benefit of both the board and the public, uh, these are cases 135, 138, and 163, I believe. 135 being 1117 Second Avenue South, 138 being 807 Bradford Avenue, and finally 163 is 2021 and 2023 Beach Avenue. With the board's permission, we could have the planning staff representative address the board with regard to each of these three cases, which of course involves sidewalk variances, with Council Bill 2016-493 having not only passed in April, but now taken effect on July 1st, 2017. This is our first board meeting since the new sidewalk guidelines have been in place. Therefore, we would... Uh, be happy to hear from planning staff to give us some input with regard to their formal recommendations to the board on those cases. Absolutely, Mr. S uh, we do also have Councilman Sledge that just walked in. John Michael? I'll take that up. Okay. Um, Mr. Sloan, come forward. Welcome back to the BZA. Board members, back when I joined this board, he was our lawyer. So. Yes. Well, welcome back. The side. You've been promoted. You've been promoted, well, <laughs> and a little bit busier now. A little bit busier than uh, the city's keeping oh. the planning department. I'm sorry. The city is keeping the planning department pretty busy right now. But I, I, if the the board doesn't mind, I have uh, two uh, other staff members. That yeah, I'd please like come to forward. And identify up. yourself for the record. And um, board members, as you know, um, Councilman Henderson um, shepherded a very ambitious sidewalk bill, which recently impassed the Metro Council. So we have new rules and regulations related to sidewalks. And the Planning Commission now is going to give us recommendations um, when we have sidewalk variances. So. I think it's very appropriate that planning is here to talk to us about kind of how the original sidewalk bill happened again and what the changes are and kind of the format of your recommendations and what are the criteria that you looked upon in making these recommendations. And the other thing I know, Mr. Sloan, is while these are your recommendations, walk us through the process that other metro agencies are also involved when you make your recommendations to us. Yes, uh, again, my name is Doug Sloan. I'm the director of the planning department. And let me go ahead and introduce Michael Briggs, who's one of our senior planners uh, and handles uh, almost all, if not all, of our transportation uh, issues. Uh, this is a pretty big task for uh, for him to head up. But uh, Peter Burr, who also works not only with the planning department, but also with the MPO and multimodal transportation and, and works with Michael quite a bit with that. And works closely, as they both do, uh, with the public works department. Uh, to your point, Chairman, uh, we uh, these requests we uh, communicate with various departments depending on where the request for uh, sidewalk variance might come up. We might, well, almost always, we work with the Public Works Department to get their input. Uh, but if it's in a historic district, we work with historical uh, board, uh, historical commission, and the department. We also uh, sometimes will have to work with uh, the Water Services Department as we deal with stormwater issues. But it really is dependent on where the the sidewalk variance is being sought and where it might impact. Uh, even uh, sometimes it impacts the trees. And so uh, we meet with Stevan Kiffett uh, in the codes department uh, and work closely with the codes department on all these issues as well. There's very seldom a day that I, I'm not down in Bill Herbert's office or he, he and mine for one reason or another. Uh, Mr. Sloan, tell us about this new bill and kind of how it impacts us and everybody with how the sidewalk ordinance used to be and what has changed. Well, I'll try to give a, a quick overview, um, and that is that uh, many of our citizens were concerned that we, we're going through the level of growth that we're seeing in the city today and that a lot of the development that was happening uh, wasn't contributing to the improvement of the sidewalk situation that we have in our neighborhoods. Um, and a lot of that was because of infill development that might just be one lot at a time. <clears throat> but uh, oftentimes it was because they already had the, the entitlements and they were building whatever the development was and they weren't required to, to do sidewalk additions. And there's, there's a lot more to it than that, but I, uh, just for these purposes. But basically, Ms. Henderson's bill, when you do a lot of infill development in certain areas of town, you are required to build a certain amount of sidewalks in front of the structure that you're 
building or materially remodeling, right? Correct, and and not just the uh, the length of the sidewalk is the issue, but the overall design of the sidewalk. Uh, we have the major and collector street plan uh, that has been adopted by the Planning Commission, and it sets out what types of sidewalk configurations belong in, in what areas, what sidewalk widths, what landscaping widths need to be at, at those locations. And if you have a sidewalk that's in a dense uh, uh, corridor along one of our transportation corridors, then we would look for wider sidewalks there because we simply have more pedestrians and, and more of our community using those sidewalks. Uh, the same thing goes for our collectors. Uh, we ask for wider sidewalks there than we, than we might uh, our secondary streets and, and the streets back in our neighborhoods. But as they, as they uh, start together in the sidewalk network and move towards these larger corridors, the demands on the buffer between the roadway and the sidewalk grows and the, and the width of the sidewalk uh, increases as well. Uh, and then we, we had a lot of conflicts. I mean, Nashville, we're not in Kansas. Uh, it's not flat. Uh, so we meet all kinds of conflicts with topography, uh, with trees, as I mentioned just a moment ago. Yes, uh, no talking bad about our mayor's home state. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to target Kansas. <laughs> I could have chosen any of the flat states out, out west. Uh, but it's, it's a lot more difficult uh, for developers, for our community uh, to address these issues with, with all these problems. And that's usually why they come uh, before this board, is there's a topography issue or there's some existing condition that is making it difficult for the property owner uh, to be able to comply with these sidewalk guidelines. Uh, so one of the things that we do when the application is filed for a, uh, for a variance is that we sit and we look at it, we look at the various issues that they're confronted with, and that's one of the things that we're working closer with Code's department on, and that is collecting exactly what is the, the issue. Why, why is the property owner unable to comply with the, the current sidewalk requirements? And get that ferreted out on the front end as much as possible and see if we can resolve those internally before uh, that they might have to come before y'all. Uh, so that's one of the first things we do. Also, again, talking with public works uh, or other departments to make sure is there already a plan uh, for sidewalks to be built there. Uh, we wouldn't want to have to require a property owner to put sidewalks in when we know that public works is about to redo that whole street and put a sidewalk network in. So a part of uh, Council Lady Henderson's bill requires that we go through that effort and, and gives them the opportunity not to have to build them if we have imminent plans to go ahead and, and put those sidewalks in. So uh, we go through that process and, and we also sit down and look at uh, ways to uh, work around whatever that conflict is. If there's a way to adjust it so that we move around a tree or we maybe shrink the, the planning zone so that the sidewalk avoids having to move a number of uh, poles. Uh, one thing that we absolutely want to avoid is placing the poles in the middle of the sidewalk or building new sidewalks with poles in the center. So we make adjustments where we can in, in that way as, as well. Uh, but through that process, uh, we have to, and, and I know that I've spoken with the, the board members before uh, during one of the uh, retreats uh, about how we prioritize some of those things. There are certain issues that uh, we feel are important enough that a variance just isn't an appropriate uh, accommodation. Uh, one of those is to make sure that our sidewalks are ADA compliant. Uh, that there's very few things that we believe are uh, sufficient to allow us to ignore uh, the American with Disabilities Act uh, requirements for sidewalks. So that's our, our top priority. Um, and Michael, what's one of our uh, ones that... Transit is... Uh, transit's another major one. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody uh, on this board uh, the need for transit. I know y'all are all very involved in our community, so you're, you're familiar with the issues that we have there. Uh, but where sidewalks are close to our transit lines, and as, as we're trying to uh, create that network with the sidewalk to reach to the transit areas, that's also uh, a very high priority for us that, that we feel that it would take a very exceptional circumstance to uh, prevent someone from having to put in a sidewalk at that location. Not that we wouldn't find a way to adjust the sidewalks to, to get around some of the other issues. But uh, some of the things that, um, that we know are things that we have to make accommodations for, and it gets back to topography is a very good uh, example. Uh, topography, we know that we're going to have to work around that. Uh, but oftentimes we see that that alone shouldn't be the reason. You sh 
you should be able to engineer uh, through most topography issues. Um, Okay, so this is the sticking point that we'll normally have when someone sits in that position and they say we can't build this because of topography. You're saying that most of the time they could get around that. Most. I'm not saying in every circumstance. I mean, uh, there are a number of places that, that we can all think of around town where uh, because of steep slope, especially with elevated streets next to a, a piece of property that sits well below uh, the street, that's a difficult situation to to cure oftentimes in those situations, though the other side of the street will be elevated. Uh, and it may even require, and I believe that this board has heard a case not too long ago, uh, where it, require, it was going to require quite a bit of grading and in grading into the side of a hill with a retaining wall to pull it off. But but oftentimes when you have a lower side, you may have a higher side on, on the on across the street. Uh, and in those cases, either getting them to construct it on, on the other side of the street, if that's possible, if we have the right of way, uh, or uh, sometimes it's paying into an in lieu. Uh, we, we have an in lieu fund which uh, to say it in plainer terms, that if, if you're not going to build the sidewalk, because let's say that the situation that I described a moment ago with topography just simply doesn't allow it, uh, but you may not have control over the other side of the street, uh, which might bring us up to the to the next connection of the sidewalk where we'd want to go, then you might be able to pay into the in lieu in some situations like that. And some, we just, if you have control over that side of the street, then we would still ask you to go through the expenditure and put it on that side of the street. But the in-lieu fund is set up in a way where um, where the sidewalk is unattainable for whatever reason. You can take what that sidewalk would have cost, and the Public Works Department has a, a per uh, foot, uh, per uh, not square foot, but linear foot uh, cost assessment with sidewalks that you would pay into. And then once enough of that is collected, Public Works uses that to build sections of sidewalks uh, that connect our, our, our network. Um, with all that said, what I think might be uh, helpful at this point is for us to go through uh, the first case um, and... Could, uh, I, could I ask one question about the NLU fund? Uh, and I might have this wrong, but it, uh, I believe previously the in lieu fund was was one of the choices. It's like you you could build it, you could pay into the fund, or you could ask for a variance. It, uh, and I might not be wording that correctly as a choice, but is that is that a first option now, or, or is that only an option when someone has determined that the sidewalk can't be built? Uh, it's mostly an option for one and two family uh, residential. Um, so they don't have to come to the Board of Zoning Appeals in some instances. Uh, there's some checks that we have to look at if there's an just a, a existing adjacent sidewalk, it's still required. Um, so there's a couple of few things that we still need to check, but that's an option for one and two family residential uh, to do the in lieu. Um, now, I think you all still have the option of doing an in lieu beyond what's in the zoning code. I've got a question related to this, and this has come up a couple times recently. Let's say we have, there's one section of the sidewalk that they have to build that's just really tricky for topography and the rest is fine. Can we structure a hybrid version of in lieu that for this section you could pay into the fund, but then you're going to build the rest? I, I would say we'd be open to that. Um, I, I think in areas where uh, topography, for example, is an issue, uh, you, we may look at an alternative design. So it may have to be a more narrow sidewalk. So if mm -hmm. eight foot sidewalks are required with the four foot grass strip along most of the site, it may have to come in closer to the road and just mm -hmm. be a five foot sidewalk in, in some of those cases. Great. I have a couple questions as well, um, based on things that have come up at prior meetings. And as I hear you both speaking, you refer to sidewalk and then you refer to green strip or buffer. So when you consider sidewalk, you simply mean the concrete. Is that correct? Uh, well, the major and collector street plan outlines both a planning strip or the green buffer and the sidewalk width. So we're really talking about both pieces. Um, so that would be more a sidewalk system, would you refer to that? We've referred to it as the street side. So there's usually the pavement of what's on the street and this is what's adjacent to the street. But uh, when we're discussing the sidewalk requirements, we're talking about the uh, entirety from the curb 
uh, to the end of the, the right of way uh, where the, the property begins that's being developed. All, all of that system, if you will, the sidewalk system, uh, we look at as one piece. It's gotten confusing in the past um, because people speak of sidewalk and you just generically mean the concrete, but you are talking about the whole system. I'm just getting clarification based on prior cases. Um, and then what is the main purpose, would you say, for the green strip that is between the concrete sidewalk and the road? Uh, so it serves several functions. So one, it provides shade. Um, you can put street trees um, in that space. Um, and so in Nashville, that that's important when you're walking around in the summer heat. Um, some shade makes walking more comfortable. Um, in instances where there are no street trees, um, it also serves as a buffer between traffic. So. Um, the street trees not only serve as a calming effect on traffic to help reduce uh, speeds, um, it helps with uh, walking and making it more comfortable. Um, and in areas uh, where the, the strip is wider, it acts as a larger buffer and um, enhances safety for people walking. And uh, we're finding that a lot of the, the poles that we're all concerned about that are currently sitting in the middle of a five foot sidewalk that the sidewalk goes right to the curb. Uh, the buffer oftentimes is where the, the telephone poles or light poles can exist uh, and not be in the sidewalk. Could, could I ask you, Mr. Sloan, to put on your lawyer hat just for a second? I'm not allowed to do that, I don't think, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Just think like a lawyer. You don't have to answer as a lawyer. Uh, do under this new legislation, do you feel that we have the authority, uh, this board, to to a approve a compromise uh, other than than what planning is recommended or uh, what the the appellant is asking for? For instance, if there's I'm just going to use random numbers, but let, let's say there's a, a five-foot green strip and a, a five-foot sidewalk, and uh, the appellant is applying for variance not to have to do it at all. Can can we say uh, you can do a three-foot green strip and a four-foot sidewalk? Do, do we have that authority? I, I believe you do. Uh, I believe that from, uh, unless Michael feels otherwise, or the other attorneys spread out throughout the room uh, feel differently. I, I believe you do. And, and, and I know that in the drafting uh, that it was intentional to write it in a way where that was possible. Uh, I know that in the previous language there was some concern about whether that authority existed or not. Uh, and there was an effort in, this, in the drafting of the legislation uh, that Council Lady Anderson put through for that very option to be available. Um, and, and, and I think, quite frankly, uh, and now I probably am uh, going well beyond what I'm supposed to be doing, and uh, I would say the state statute ex expects this board to exercise equity in trying to find a solution other than the strict application of the zoning code. Uh, so I would, I would say yes. Yes, thank you. Any other um, general topics about the sidewalk between uh Michael um, Peter. I'll just mention that uh, it's been good working with code staff on it. I think Debbie and Bill and John have all been really good to work with on this. Um, it's hard, I think, when a new uh, law like this passes in order to get everybody's processes in place. And so um, we're trying to streamline it as much as possible um, and be as responsive as we can um, when applicants come in. We um, also appreciate your streamlined form to good. recommend or not recommend um, sidewalks, I mean, uh, for approval of variances. Um, everything on one page, it's very easy to read, and um, I think it just concise, concisely states your position, so thank you. And, okay. and pictures are always welcome, too, for us architects on the board. <laughs> Anytime you want to include a drawing, feel free. Okay. Um, jo is John Michael, did we lose him? Uh, he just stepped out. Okay. So uh, anything else to add, Mr. Sloan, before John Michael comes back? 
Only asking, did so for these three cases that, uh, and we really appreciate y'all taking these up um, at, at the front. Yes. But would you like us to state our recommendation yes. first? Yeah. Okay. And, and this is a good exercise, and that we could kind of see based on the new law and the new statute and kind of your recommendations. And, and we John don't Michael want to interrupt y'all's proceedings in John the future. Michael we just should, thought on that. And Mr. Chairman, if you'd like to in. see the actual presentation yeah, of the case from staff, just yeah. to get some context for yeah. what planning has by way of recommendation, yeah. we're let's glad to do that. Let's start with uh, case 135. Case 135 is located at 1117 Second Avenue South, just a, what, maybe two miles from our current location on down Second Avenue. The um, aerial gives you a better view of the existing church at this location. I think our docket made reference to residential property to be converted for church use. That was done a long time ago. This is merely an expansion of the existing church at that location near the intersection of Second Avenue South and Chestnut. The site plan that was submitted shows the uh, proposed construction of the church structure. Then the second site plan that was submitted addressed the sidewalks in their current condition there at the intersection of 2nd Avenue South and Chestnut. From my recent site visit, a uh, view of the empty portion of the property that's in the upper left-hand corner, kind of looking back toward Chestnut, then the straight-on view from across the street. The views up and down 2nd Avenue show the existing sidewalks and planter strips in their current condition. And hopefully with that, just a little bit of a presentation, that gives some context for planning then to explain their recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Mr. Sloan, as you know, this is one of our older streets in Nashville, and it looks like there are sidewalks on both sides. So what is your recommendation and why for this case? Uh, I'm going to let uh, Michael Briggs okay. handle each one of these cases. Thank Very you. Very good. Um, so you all have the recommendation in front of you, and I'd like to walk through some of our thinking on it so you know where planning staff is coming from. Um, so on this portion of 2nd Avenue South, uh, the major and collector street plan identifies a four-foot grass strip and an eight-foot sidewalk. Um, the applicant has requested uh, to keep the so existing... So what are we looking at in this picture on the lower... That picture right over there with the 35 mile an hour street sign. How wide is that ga grass strip and how wide is that sidewalk? That's a good question. It's probably a one to two foot wide grass strip and probably a five foot uh, sidewalk. Okay, and you're saying now it's supposed to be eight foot wide sidewalk and then what? And a four foot grass strip. Okay. Um, the, this portion um, of 2nd Avenue South is identified for future light rail in MTA's in motion transit plan. Um, that weighed heavily in our analysis uh, where we feel strongly that good urban design and good comfortable walking conditions are needed uh, along the corridor. Um, and additionally, a specific plan uh, that's across the street and adjacent to the site at 1114 and 1116 2nd Avenue South uh, was approved uh, where sidewalks were upgraded to meet the major and collector street plan. I don't believe they have started construction of that development. Um, so given those factors, our staff has recommended disapproval uh, and would like for the applicant to upgrade the sidewalks to the major and collector street plan uh, standards. Uh, but if the Board of Zoning Appeals finds that the variance should be granted based on re the review standards of section 17.40.370 of the zoning code, then staff recommends that the applicant pay the in lieu contribution. And board members, we often have these cases in kind of further parts of the county where, you know, the person says, well, look, this is some industrial area and there's nothing around and all this. This is in the basically booming area of Wedgwood, Houston. Uh, there's May Hosiery is getting remodeled. There's all sorts of restaurants and bars and coffee shops in the area. There's Dudley Park nearby. So this is one of those that, you know, is going to be uh, active, I guess. Shall we say? And to, to emphasize uh, what Mr. Briggs said just a moment ago, um, Fourth Avenue is something that uh, we, along with MTA and RTA and Public Works, and it's also identified in In Motion, is one of our major transit corridors. Um, and the fact that it, it makes its way all the way through town, uh, it, it makes it a, a very attractive corridor to, to place uh, our transit system on in it fairly soon matter because this part of second avenue literally goes all the way up to the courthouse right second avenue uh, i apologize second avenue and fourth and sixth are corridors that that we are focused on okay questions 
So, John Michael, how should we proceed and should we just kind of... Mr. Chairman, of course you'll want to hear from the appellant, him or herself, on each of these cases. Yeah. We're happy to, if planning's willing to stick around, have them make the presentation for each of the three cases, but I hate to lose context for that recommendation and not hear from the appellants. Of note, all three of these uh, sidewalk-oriented cases happen to fall neatly into Council District Number 17. And, and at this hour, we are joined by Council Member Colby Sledge. If the board wished to hear from Councilman Sledge on this or other cases, we uh, could do that at this point. Or we I, could. I think it's a perfect time to hear from the council. Very well. So Councilman, Councilman Sledge, Sledge, thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. Um, so, as noted, yes, all three that you're going to be considering today fall in District 17. We are sidewalk Thunderdome right now. So, um, this is going to make my comments seem a little out of context, and to be honest, because on case 2017 135, I was actually going to voice my support for the appellant that they be provided the exception for our sidewalk. The reasoning is such, um, as you can see, the sidewalk network within what is Chestnut Hill that we're looking at right here, it's actually pretty robust. Um, it's, it's one of, as you noted, Chair, uh, Nashville's older neighborhoods and therefore does have a pretty uh, built out sidewalk network. The sidewalk that you're looking at in particular that runs uh, on north-south on this property of the Second Avenue one was actually replaced by the city during the time I have served in office, so within the last 18 months, that sidewalk down 2nd Avenue has been replaced by Public Works. So I'm a little uh, taken aback, to be honest, um, that the, the standards um, were not put in place at the time. If there was going to be repair to the sidewalk, that they would have been built to the city standards um, at that time. Um, having said that, this church is, is coming before you primarily because they're doing an expansion and so they want to be able to continue their use as a church. Um, it just so happens that their timing has fallen right at the beginning of this uh, of this new world that we're living in regarding sidewalks. Um, so my request on this one, and I'm probably going to have a different uh, viewpoint on each of these, which is probably why we're having this kind of discussion. Um, my request on this one would actually be to grant the exception um, regarding the sidewalks around this church because they're truthfully coming before you to just expand to continue a current use. They are not adding pedestrian traffic um, from this. And and the adjacent properties, I believe, unless they have are working on a plan now that they haven't come to me for, are remaining in their current state. They're just building to the north side, if I remember correctly, from the schematic. Um, so that would be my request on that case. I don't okay. know if you want me, so. Councilman, any questions for Councilman Sledge? Thank you for being here and stating that. John Michael. With that, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be appropriate to hear from the appellant on case number 2017-135. Again, reminding the board that's at 1117 2nd Avenue South, the Shiloh Baptist Church is the appellant and owner of the property. The request is for an expansion of the uh, church use at the subject property and for the sidewalk variance. Is the representative for the Shiloh Baptist Church present? Well. Yeah, I'd say that's right. So, okay. Mr. Chairman, in the absence of an appellant, the board has now heard a presentation with regard to the case and has the opportunity to choose whether to defer, deny. Uh, I'm not sure that you have the I, goods I think, in front of I you to grant. I think since the council person is here and is in support, we will give them a deferral. Very well. With that, case number 135 will be continued to our next scheduled BZA date of July the 20th, 2017, and will be taken at or near the top of the agenda. Okay. The next case on our agenda, also as noted in Council District Number 17, involves the property at 807 Bradford Avenue. The request is for a sidewalk variance in the OR20 Zoning District is in conjunction with the construction of a two-story addition to the rear of the existing office building. The presentation from staff shows the zoning map uh, here just off of the 8th Avenue South Corridor and the part of Bradford where it intersects with the very first street off of 8th, which is Elliott. The aerial shows the property in its current configuration. This is kind of flipped from the zoning map, but looking straight on into 807 Bradford, where it intersects with Elliott. The site plan submitted gives a depiction of the proposed construction and the condition of the uh, sidewalk proposal. From my site visit in the fall, when this case was before the board for a completely separate and unrelated issue, still the same structure, still the same streets, and therefore valid photos. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, the pattern we're developing here is for the planning staff to explain their recommendation to the board with regard to this case number 2017-138 for the property located at 807 Bradford. Okay. Let's go. 
All right, uh, so the metro standard here is a four foot grass strip, five foot sidewalk that's per the local street standard. So this is not a street that's identified in the major and collector street plan. Um, that's along both Bradford Avenue and Elliott Avenue. Um, there is Can you talk to us for the people that are watching at home or even here, what is a major street and what is a collector street? Sure. So we identify within our planning, transportation plan, um, is the street network, which major streets are your arterials. So like what, for, for example, it's, what's for example, it's like 8th Avenue South, uh, Franklin Pike, Dickerson Pike, mm -hmm. uh, your main corridors. They West tend End. to funnel, correct, they tend to funnel high amounts of traffic um, and collect those traffic, that traffic um, and dis distribute it throughout the network. Your collectors tend to be uh, the streets that funnel the traffic to those arterials. So the streets uh, that are right off those streets that might flow into those streets. Would be some of your collectors. Now in this instance, this is identified as a local street. Um, and those designations really only capture how we move traffic uh, through the transportation system. It doesn't address uh, things like urban design and the context and character of the street. So, so the sidewalk rules are different from major streets and local streets. Right, typically there's wider sidewalks required on your major streets mm -hmm. versus your local streets. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get that for the record. Thank Good you. question. Um, so in this instance, a four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk uh, is the requirement, both along Bradford and Elliott. Um, today there is a sidewalk along Bradford that is five feet wide. Um, there is no grass strip. Um, there's no sidewalk um, along Elliott. Um, it is, the site itself is about 200 feet from um, a major uh, local service or a rapid bus service identified um, in the in motion transit plan. So 8th Avenue South, uh, which is to the left on the screen here um, is uh, that corridor um, in the in motion plan. Um, so staff has recommended to approve with conditions given that the site's proximity is close to transit service um, and looking at the sidewalk gaps in the network. We've also worked with the applicant. They've looked at an alternative design on Elliott Avenue. Um, that shows issues with grading, and this is a case where topography is an issue and make it difficult to build even the five foot wide sidewalk. Um, so that approval is contingent upon them uh, upgrading the existing Bradford Avenue sidewalks uh, to the local standard, which is the four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk. Um, we feel that that is needed since it connects directly to uh, the Eighth Avenue corridor. Um, the applicant is also um, required or as part of our condition shall pay the sidewalk and loo contribution along Elliott because they've demonstrated the topography as being an issue along that frontage um, and then consult with Public Works about striping a crosswalk um, across Elliott Avenue um, and that would connect into the existing sidewalks that are shown to the right there on your screen. Why are we dealing with two sides of the street as opposed to just one with the sidewalks of Bradford and Elliott? Can I explain that to us? So the law now requires uh, where the existing sidewalks do not meet uh, either the major and collector street plan standards or the metro standard, um, which in this case for local streets is a four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk, it's required to be upgraded. So since this is a corner lot, that's what you're saying? Right. Yeah, so along I'm all sorry. of the public right-of-ways, it meets the, the property. Okay. Um, and on this one in particular, and I know it's hard to see uh, with this photo, but uh, there's a lot of topography uh, uh, on this street. And along Elliott, um, the topography uh, is immediately, uh, or, or the, the drop from the road, much like I described just a moment ago, happens immediately after the roadway. And there's a line of trees there. And uh, it's so, so there would be a real challenge just to create a sidewalk for, for much length at all or much, much width at all along Elliott. And there's a, a sidewalk that's relatively new uh, just directly across uh, Elliott from this intersection. Um, so if if pedestrians want to go down to Elliott, there, there is a sidewalk that's in existence. So those are the reasons why we felt like for that section an in-lieu uh, would be appropriate instead of construction. Okay, question for the planning staff. Okay, John Michael. If the board wish to hear from Council Member Sledge, this would be the appropriate time. Yes. 
Thank you again, Board. So on this, uh, I, I had initially written, I think, to you in opposition of granting the variance. That was um, before talking with the applicant just now a few minutes ago and hearing from planning's recommendation. With the conditions that they have described, and I agree with them completely on the topography, it is an issue on Elliott. Um, with the conditions they've described, I think that they're appropriate. Also, to keep in mind, the time this application was put forward uh, for the variance, I think this was probably before a another application that will come before you in a couple of weeks that could potentially greatly impact the use right here at the corner of Bradford and uh, 8th Avenue. And so with that in mind, I think it makes sense to uh, to grant the variance with the conditions as, as described by planning so that we can get the improved sidewalk in, but make sure that we're doing it in the right place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Sledge. John Michael. We would invite the appellant forward for case number 2017-138, Mr. Sean Henry on behalf of the property owners, the Felts. And board presenting members. the case for 807 Bradford Avenue, the request for the variance from sidewalk requirements in the OR20 zoning district. We have a letter from Mr. Henry's uh, in the packet, so mm -hmm. we've all seen that. Mr. Henry, welcome to BZA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals, my name is Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street. Good to, good to see you. Um, on my right is Mr. Larry Feltz, uh, and on my left is his son, Kyle Feltz. They are the property owner. Uh, Kyle operates a uh, real estate company out of, this, uh, out of this property, out of the former residence. This property is zoned for office use. It's used for office use. <clears throat> we supplied to you a, a letter on, um, on Monday, uh, and previously we had supplied a letter back in May. Our application was actually filed, I believe, in April. Uh, this matter was scheduled for you on June 15. We deferred from June 15 to this date. Uh, frankly, to give some more consideration to the, the the topography and to have a meeting with staff, which we've done, and the staff, as you just heard, is agreeable uh, that there's a hardship here. They have they agree with the hardship and the recommending uh, recommending the variance. Uh, let me share with you, if I may, uh, some photographs of the property. If you can hand up. So, Mr. Henry, do you agree with what uh, planning has said and what the council person has said? The, the only issue uh, that I, that my client is taking here today, uh, the the staff report came out this morning. Mm -hmm. We barely have had time to sure. to really digest it. But there's three conditions, and the condition of of uh, painting the crosswalk in order to connect to the sidewalk that runs the full length of Elliott Avenue. So it's important for you to realize there is a sidewalk there on Elliott Avenue, runs the full length from Bradford uh, to the next street. So if you're, if you're coming across the front of this property on foot, uh, we're prepared to stripe across so that you can cross the street, get on that sidewalk, and, and go on your way headed southbound. Uh, the issue here is the staff is recommending that the sidewalk that is in very good condition, and Mr. Feltz here, Kyle can speak to that, but they, you can see in that aerial photo, they want that sidewalk, which is in good shape, pulled up and replaced with four feet of grass strip and a five foot sidewalk. And of course, that means there has to be a transition at the property line, so as you come across that screen to the left, there's going to, there's going to be four feet of grass strip and then it's gonna abruptly terminate into the existing sidewalk that has no grass strip. So we think the character of that street as it presently exists is an important consideration for this board. Uh, appreciate uh, the prior quest questions of planning staff about factors to be considered, um, and certainly the character of the street in its present condition is one consideration we'd, we'd ask for you to consider. So in summary, my, my client's prepared to uh, pay the fee in lieu of, uh, based on the prior law, um, which we've talked with staff about about that that rate, um, and secondly, willing to paint that crosswalk. Uh, but frankly, we would ask for relief from the planning staff recommendation that you impose upon this applicant the removal of that existing sidewalk on Bradford and to replace it with a new standard. And board members, Mr. Henry has given us uh, pictures. If no one's been down Elliott Avenue before, it's a beautiful street, it's got this medium, but the pictures that you passed out definitely show the issues of topography on that area. So you're basically asking for the in lieu for the portion 
that which portion are you asking for in lieu? <clears throat> My client's happy to pay the the, uh, the fee in lieu of construction on Elliott Avenue, mm -hmm. but is asking for relief from having to change in any way the existing sidewalk on Bradford. Okay. Th that, by the way, un under the prior law, prior to July 1st, there was no requirement to do anything with Bradford anyway. Yes. Uh, because we filed when we filed, because we were scheduled to be here, we, we think we should be considered under that pre-July 1st uh, criteria. Uh, tell, tell me again, I'm sorry, the pre-July 1 criteria, just so I have it directly. Right, the uh, pre-July 1, the only sidewalk that had to be installed is, is, is to link up an existing sidewalk where there is there is an existing sidewalk to link it up along the remaining frontage where there is no sidewalk. So pre-July 1, there's no requirement to rip up existing sidewalk and put in new standard sidewalk. Okay. Um, Mr. Herbert, uh, his argument related to, well, we had filed originally, but in the medium, in the interim, uh, this new sidewalk bill passes. What's the legal effect of that? And, you know, does filing before have any, anything to do with, uh, or our lawyer can handle this? I think it's better for Metro Legal. Yes. Regardless, I think of when the application was filed, mm -hmm. um, I believe it was deferred, is what he said. It was previously mm -hmm. deferred. It's now before you today, obviously. Mm -hmm. The law took effect on July 1st. So my opinion is that the prior, had it been heard at the time the prior law was in effect, that prior law would have um, been the law that you considered. But because it's being heard today because of a deferral, mm -hmm. I think the, July, the law that's in effect now is what applies. Mm -hmm. So the policy is going to be that the new law applies to all things pending, but subsequently heard after July 1. John Michael. Sorry, um, I didn't realize I had turned my microphone off. Yes, I think that's correct. If the case was not heard prior to July 1, even if it had been filed, but it's not heard by this board before July 1, then I think the July 1 law is what applies. And Mr. Chairman, from the staff perspective, when it comes to actual permitting, even if a case had been heard, say, in June of 2017 and approval granted, if the permit was not obtained and in hand for the developer prior to July 1, 2017, then they've not achieved um, the vested rights pursuant to the analysis of the Vested Rights Act of 2015 that's been in effect for some time now, at least in, according to the uh, interpretation that we've seen in the very little case law that's out there at this point. So it, not only about uh, a case being heard and approved by the board, but even obtaining the permit, which ultimately triggers those vested rights for the developer or landowner. Thank you, John Michael. Um, board, okay. I have a question. So are you saying that your hardship for not providing the sidewalk on Bradford is that it doesn't, it will ultimately not match up with other sidewalks on Bradford? And is there another hardship? Is that the only hardship that I'm hearing? From a physical constraint, that is the physical hardship. But the relief that we're asking for on, on Bradford is the fact that equity begs for treating this client, you know, with the time frame that they voluntarily deferred past July 1st. And they voluntarily deferred from the June 15 meeting to July 6th after we had meetings with staff. Um, we met with Mr. Herbert, met with Mr. John Michael, met with planning staff talking about, you know, all of this. Uh, there was no expectation that we had that there was going to be an insistence that here today the, the new law was going to be applied. Well, then tell me this. So the property to the left here on the corner of, I guess, 8th and Bradford, when they come to us with a redevelopment and say, well, the property next to us, even though we're here under the new law, the property next to us, if we put it in under post-July 1 law, it's not going to match up with the sidewalk in front of your business. I mean, aren't we going to be, if we grant what you're asking, isn't that problematic for us down the road in getting this new law put into effect? I, I think you're getting ready to face a lot of requests like this. Ab absolutely. You're, you're going to be asked um, on many occasions coming forward for you to recognize the current situation because the, the essence of this bill is to get sidewalks installed or replaced in this case, replacing sidewalks in order to get that grass strip on an incremental property 
lot by lot basis. And so you're, you're inevitably going to have that mismatch um, because you're deciding these on a lot by lot basis. And so in some instances it may make sense to require uh, a complete replacement of, a, of an existing sidewalk. In some instances, it may not. We're suggesting that what you have here under these circumstances, particularly in light of the fact that my client sought this um, very timely, well before any expectation of being here under the new law, that, that you should consider that in this case. And, and that certainly would not set a precedent for anyone coming forward. We filed when we filed, we were on the agenda, we voluntarily deferred. Uh, there's no one else who can come before you and say, you did it for them, you need to do it for us. And I will point out to further clarify my statement earlier, I do think that the law that's in effect on July 1st applies because that's the date that this case is being considered by the board. But I would point out that the law says uh, you may require a contribution to the pedestrian network consistent with the subsections D of this section and alternative sidewalk design or other mitigation for the loss of the public improvement as a condition to the variance. So I do think that this applies, but I think that y'all can consider the extenuating circumstances if you think that is appropriate, balance that with the recommendations from planning. Sure, we have an authority to do what Right. You, you, I, I believe you yes. do, but it, I also think that is, that authority is consistent with the law today. I, I don't want. I want to be clear that I think that the law, law that was in a, that is in effect as of July first is the law that we're under. I agree. Can we ask them to pay into the in lieu um, contribution? Yes, you can. I have questions um, for planning again, if that's appropriate. There's no oppositions in this case, is there? No. Okay. Doug, come back. Ah, uh, just like the old days. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is regarding, and I, I think this is for you, could be for someone else for Metro, but I've never heard um, when a new development occurs that you do not have to replace the sidewalk. I guess I'm speaking from my own experience with my own projects where I've always been asked to follow the MCSP and dedicate right of way and make new sidewalks. So this is news to me that they didn't have to. Well, if again, first I want to point out that this ordinance passed in April. Uh, it, it didn't just pass in July. It's been on the book since April. So there was uh, a little lag time. That, for it that was intentional to allow the opportunity to bring your case forward up until this point. But at some point, you do have to enforce it. Uh, so I want to say at first, uh, Michael, you want to speak to when we used to require it versus now when we're requiring it on sure. these uh, secondary streets? So uh, there's a number of factors that go into when we've required sidewalks to uh, be redeveloped where you have existing uh, ones. So if it's an application that comes before planning, uh, if it's a specific plan, we're usually holding those developments to a much higher standard um, and they're required to meet the major and collector street plan or the local street standard. Um, now, as we've continued to sort of ramp up our sidewalk requirements, um, I do believe the zoning code did ha refer to the metro standard before. Um, and so it, it's a matter of interpretation then um, across the different departments as to what was being required. Um, I think with this bill going forward, most of the departments are now on the same page of that if it doesn't meet the standard, that it has to be ripped out and the new sidewalk uh, put in place that meets the new standard. What does your department think if they were here before July 1st, would they have had to rip up the sidewalk and redo the sidewalk to meet the standard? Um, how, how do we feel about it being enforced uh, as of July 1? Well, if they I came here a done. year ago, what would you have um, recommended? If they were here a year ago, uh, I mean, I think that we still would have recommended that along this quarter, knowing the development pattern that we're seeing, knowing that 8th Avenue, that this is a block off of 8th Avenue, again, one of our major transit corridors, and frankly, and, and the councilman alluded to this, uh, development that we know is imminent in this area, um, then we still would have requested that on Bradford, 
that they meet the major and collector street plan uh, if we were given the opportunity to speak before this board at that time. And my second question is regarding the transitions from um, you know existing sidewalk construction that's right up against the road to the new standard. Um, how do you handle those transitions? Sure, so there's two ways that they can handle it. One is that the sidewalk tapers back and ties into the existing sidewalk on the on, adjacent On their property. property. Yes. Uh, the other is that they basically build it to where it's at the new uh, dimension um, and then where the grass strip would be that there is a paved pad right there and so it's more of a Z or a zigzag that would be done. Um, and I think Public Works is leaning more towards the zigzag because when the adjacent properties come in to be developed, it's easier just to line the sidewalks up and then rip out the, the pad that's there. Okay, any other questions? Well, Mr. Briggs, if you don't mind, because I'm unschooled like my colleagues are, so that's kind of getting to my point. When this property on the corner comes to us saying, well, this address didn't have to do it, what you're saying is, just talk to me like I'm three. <laughs> what would the sidewalk look like if we ask them to at least partially put in the grass strip because I, I mean, I think we want to try to accommodate what the mayor is trying to do at the same time. In this particular case, I'm very uncomfortable that the law has changed after their case was filed. Sure. So uh, let's walk through what the design would be from Elliott, which is where the median is, um, to the left, which is where 8th Avenue is. So where their property is, um, today it currently has the five-foot sidewalk and is directly next to the street. So they would, at that location, put in the four-foot grass strip and the five-foot sidewalk. Then as you head... Sure, so then as you head to the left towards 8th Avenue, uh, the sidewalk would either have to taper, so it would narrow, uh, so it would maintain the five foot dimension, but the grass strip would narrow to meet the existing sidewalk, or it would basically built and not narrow the grass strip, but where the existing sidewalk is, it's paved in with about a five foot pad so that it zigzags and hits the existing sidewalk. Is that because the right of way going toward 8th Avenue is narrower? Is that why it happened? Um, so when they build the new sidewalk on their property, it would require right of way dedication up to the back of the sidewalk. And so then the today, adjacent property would- The sidewalk gets narrow because that right. building is right there. Right. And then the adjacent property owner, if they redevelop um, at 8th Avenue along 8th, you would have a uh, four foot grass strip and either an eight to 10 foot sidewalk um, on 8th and then along uh, Bradford, it would have the local standard of the four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Chairman, just, just one more comment. There's two intervening parcels between the corner of Elliott and the corner of 8th. And we've heard here today that there may be a redevelopment of that corner at 8th and Bradford. <coughs> this is a situation that we think begs for a comprehensive sidewalk, the new sidewalk standard being installed in, at one point in time between 8th and Elliott. And the best way to do that is for my client to pay to Metro its fair share, its cost in lieu of construction, let Metro use those monies to finish out that sidewalk in cooperation with the developer when they undertake that development at the corner of 8th and Bradford. That way we have a comprehensive standard sidewalk segment for that entire street block frontage. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with two parcels in the middle with no new sidewalk, two disjointed sidewalks on either end of this uh, block and we don't get what we're trying to accomplish in this city. Okay, anything else to add? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank we're gonna close the public hearing. Well, I'll start by um, what Mr. Henry just said was very reasonable. You know, he's basically saying, look, there's a lot of development going on with the corner up there on 8th Avenue potentially and other parcels in this and we're willing to spend money to pay in the in lieu of sidewalk funds and basically the sidewalk in front of this property I guess on Bradford 
is already five feet, they would have to rip that up and build a grass strip mm -hmm. and then build another five feet so foot sidewalk. So some of you all might get into the when he filed kind of argument, but I think what he just said was pretty reasonable. Well, and they're also, the, uh, the, the recommendation from planning was to pay in lieu for the, for the side street as well. Isn't that correct? And that sidewalk would never be built anyway. There's no, uh, well, just because yeah, of the physical characteristics. We've seen the topography drawings. I mean, so it's, it, it's in a way, they're, they're putting in more, more money than the sidewalk that needs to be replaced anyway. So I think, I think that's a, a, good, okay. a good, and I, I frankly was gonna recommend that until, and then Mr. Henry said it. So he took the gust right out of my sails. Okay, well, Thanks do you wanna make a okay. motion then? Um, and remember, um, I guess if we do in lieu, there's no other um, recommendations, right? Right, because, uh, well, just to clarify, the is the appellant being requested to, to pay for the striping uh, across? That they're saying- Or is we'll, Metro gonna do that? I, okay. I'll, they'll, they'll do it. Okay. Okay. Well then, uh, I move that uh, we, approve the variance with the condition that uh, the appellant pay into the in lieu fund for both streets and- Which streets, Elliott and Elliot Bradford? Elliott and Bradford, yes. Yeah. And uh, provide the crosswalk uh, striping per Metro code. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, we have one no vote, and it's uh, it's five to one. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case in our triumvirate of uh, sidewalk discussions is case number 163. This case uh, brought by appellant Dwayne Cuthbertson on behalf of his client. It's for property located at 2021 and 2023 Beach Avenue, as noted, also in Council District Number 17. I will note on behalf of the council member, Mr. Sledge, who had to depart for another meeting, uh, he stands in support of this requested variance. Mm -hmm. The zoning map here shows you a mix of RM20 zone properties. Uh, one of the two, they're highlighted in this zoning map that's at you on Beach. The aerial shows you more facing the subject properties where they're presently located and prepared for a new development that would include, if granted, nine uh, multi uh, multi-family development or nine unit multi-family development on, across two properties in the RM20 zoning district. The request is both for a variance from the street setback requirements as well as from the current sidewalk requirements. From my recent site visit, the face of the two subject properties, the view up and down the streets, and then directly across the street in the lower right-hand corner. Um, I think the pattern we've established is for the planning department to explain its recommendation on the subject case and then call up the appellant to make his presentation. Mr. Sloan and Mr. Briggs. Thank you. So uh, this actually has two uh, recommendations from planning, a memo uh, related to the street setback um, and then also the sidewalk variance recommendation. Um, they're somewhat tied together, so I'll walk us uh, through that. Um, on Beach Avenue, uh, a four foot grass strip, five foot sidewalk is the requirement per the local street standard. Uh, the property is within 750 feet uh, walk to 8th Avenue South, which again is identified as a major local bus or rapid bus in the so in motion. So for people that don't plan. know, this is very close to the Zanies on 8th Avenue. Yes, okay. they're, they're close by. Um, the existing sidewalk design, as you can tell on your screen, uh, contains a varied grass strip, so you lose it in some places where you have driveways. Um, there's an awkward utility pole that's um, in the sidewalk at a driveway location. Um, and then a five-foot sidewalk uh, is the existing conditions. Uh, because the applicant site plan indicates an increase in residential units, um, we think that the site is likely to be disturbed, most of the site to be disturbed served, and that since the sidewalk leads to 8th Avenue South, um, we're recommending disapproval, uh, but if the Board of Zoning Appeals finds in this case that a variance should be granted, um, that the, the staff recommends that the applicant pay the in lieu fee. The related issue involving the street setback, they've requested, it's an eight foot seven inch uh, street setback, and that's typically measured from the back of the sidewalk. 
Um, staff is supportive of the uh, setback variance, but in this case, if they are required to build uh, the new sidewalk, we would imagine that the, the front of the building would remain where it is and it wouldn't be uh, predicated upon the uh, sidewalk being extended and being measured from there. So we were calculating that that would be about a five foot, uh, seven inch setback from the new sidewalk. Okay, any questions for planning staff? If I could add just a couple of more quick points, and that is uh, that this development is going from, I think it's two uh, single family residents today to nine. Uh, and we talked about the proximity to the uh, transit corridor and also that they will be taking access, I think, uh, for vehicular access from the alley in the back, uh, which is something that we think it's really great for the pedestrian environment here uh, to be able to have a continuous sidewalk without the interruption. Uh, and as Mr. Michael pointed out to me when we were looking through this case in particular, uh, we absolutely love the telephone pole in the middle of the uh, driveway in the sidewalk. It's, uh, we think NES did an excellent job of locating that there. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, John Michael is here from the applicant. Very well, we'll invite Mr. Cutperson forward to make the desired presentation on behalf of the appellant and anyone else. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case at, eight, at uh, 2020? There is one present. Uh, there will be 15 minutes allotted for the appellants to make the desired presentation. Obviously, if you wish to save some of that time for rebuttal, it should come out of this originally allotted 15 minutes, and then we'll hear from the opponents to the case. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1010 Ackland Avenue. Uh, I'm here representing the proposed development and the two requests before you. Just to be clear, right now we're only talking about the variance of the sidewalk requirement, even though planning staff's uh, presentation and recommendation kind of discuss both of those uh, elements of relief, we're only talking about the sidewalk. Um, and I, I think I, I just want to make sure that's the case. Yes. Um, Actually, I'm not. You do have a. So you have a special exception to reduce the street setback. Right. Which is not really a variance. It's right. a special exception. Okay. Yeah. It, so are we talking about. Are we discussing both elements yes, of really discuss yes. both. Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you, um, first, before we got started, do you have a community meeting with your council person and everything? We, we had a meeting with the council member, yes. And the neighborhoods were invo neighbors were invo invited? No. We, we, we talked to some neighbors, but we didn't have a community meeting. We um, talked to. Uh, we had a lengthy meeting with Councilmember Sledge. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, I feel like you're about to ask me about uh, the board rule with regard to community meetings on special um, exception special exception cases, Board of Zoning Appeals rules and regs number nine case decisions, uh, subsection I believe it's. D, part two, part C, all special exception uses approved by the board are site plan certain, part D, in the interest of having informed stakeholders in special exception cases, it's required that the appellant make contact with the district council person and neighbors within 300 feet of the subject property, staff before providing the mailing list. Um, there is a requirement for the so we didn't formally notice neighborhood. We didn't have notice to the neighbors in a special meeting. So this gets... Well, I'm sorry. Oh, did you... you we, we did provide notice to the neighbors. As did you required. send out letters to Absolutely. say come to our meeting? To come to the BZA meeting, not to... No, to come to, to a special meeting no. just about this. No. Okay. John Michael, you get if, to... If that's the case, the board's track record is to take a vote on whether or not to defer to the next available hearing date for the appellant so that there can be ample time to provide the required notice, have a community <coughs> meeting, typically in conjunction with the district council member. Uh, naturally, uh, zoning staff can provide the mailing list as required. So and, board, uh, you know, board members, as you know, this is in our rules. Special exceptions are usually a little bit more weighty than variances, and so we absolutely require that you have a community meeting before coming to us. And so mm -hmm. that's where we are. I so move. Okay. And I second. There's been a motion to, I'm assuming you're saying defer until to a community defer. meeting has yeah. happened, yes. Yes. which has been properly seconded. Any more discussion? Let's I discuss do. about I just when. I have a question because this is just a special exception for a street setback, not a special exception use. 
but I guess Correct. the rules don't differentiate. The board's application of that rule has always been for special exception cases, period. Uh, the community meeting is required. So let's ask the applicant. So we have rules in our rules that basically say if you're asking for a special exception, you have to send out letters to people within 600 feet of the property. Uh, the board rule says 300. Oh, Typically, three. we provide a 600 list in case they want to double three, down. Three, 300, and you have to have a meeting. Now, if you send out the letters and one person shows up or 10 people show up, that's a meeting. Um, but that didn't happen, so we're not able to kind of go forward for this. So we are deferring this case today, and we're going to defer it to a future meeting. So the question is, how long can you um, get a send out letters, and it'll probably have to be a month away. I would imagine. Actually, because a board hearing requires a 21-day notice, as little as a week's notice would be sufficient on these, actually. So if the appellant was able to come in tomorrow, we could generate the mailing list, get it in their hands, send out notices over the weekend, have a meeting late next week. They could be heard on the next available docket, especially if that is of any help to the expeditious which, handling of which the case. Is what, which is uh, Our next meeting is July the 20th. Okay. So do you, can you do July the 20th, or do you want to push it off further? Um, I won't. I won't be in Nashville July 20th. Okay. So I'm happy to take it up on August 3rd if that's more convenient to the appellants. Yeah. Uh, August 3rd is, we'll have to work, yeah. Okay. So we have a motion and it's been properly seconded and we're deferring it to August 3rd. All those in favor of the motion, Mr. King? I'll signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's deferred till August 3rd. Mr. Chairman, did we defer the variance as well or just the special? We deferred the entire case. We'll defer the whole thing. We're, okay. we're, we're deferring the whole thing. Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. John Michael, can we take a short break? The board will take a brief recess, then reconvene at the top of the docket with all the non sidewalk cases. I know you guys are perfect. And previously, and he'll address you again shortly. Um, the property is owned by Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Church. They are represented today by Mr. Sean Henry and also with assistance from local engineer Mr. Jay Fulmer, a verified expert in parking questions, as we have found. This is located in the RS 7.5 zoning district, and the question involves an off site parking lot for the growing church. The subject map here shows in highlighted pink along Sunrise, the, one of the two subject properties at issue where the church proposes an off-site parking use for their growing congregation. The aerial view shows the parking lot there associated with the uh, current church and the blank lot across the street. The site plan submitted shows the approximate number of parking spaces and we'll let the attorneys and the engineers explain the number they are able to generate there vis-a-vis -vis the required parking count. And from my somewhat recent um, site visit, these two photos show the lots that are partially at issue for the proposed parking. And then the view up and down the street on Sunrise, the upper left hand looking back toward Nolansville Pike, and the lower left hand looking back into the residential neighborhood, and then of course across the street from these lots into the church parking lot and with the church there in the background. Is there any opposition to this case? There is some opposition present. Therefore, the appellants will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation, saving whatever time they wish for rebuttal. And then the opponents will have their opportunity to make their presentation. There are no sidewalks or short-term rentals at issue in this case, Mr. Chairman. It's all zoning. So with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Henry. With all apologies, the council member is present. Council member Freeman wishes to address the board. He, of course, is not encumbered by any time constraints. All apologies, council member. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Board. Um, I'm just going to be brief and speak uh, mainly on the meetings that we've had with the neighbors. Uh, we have had our two meetings, <laughs> so we'll be able to go forward with that. And I think that uh, in our last meeting, I think we did make some real progress. And I guess I'm going to have some questions for um, 
for the members of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but I just want to express the, I guess, the general feel of the neighborhood. Um, the neighbors love that the church is there and the church is wildly successful. It's just, I guess the fear is that once we put the parking lot in, then it's going to be a parking lot, you know, from here on out. And it is almost right in the middle of a neighborhood. And so we have neighbors are on, you know, either side. Um, I guess it would be to the the east and then mostly bordering those properties on the north side of this uh, proposed zone. And so they're really concerned about, one, the look and feel of the neighborhood once you put the parking lot in, and then also, is there another option that can be pursued? And I think from our last meeting, we did discuss that we are going to at least look at other options as um, a more permanent fix, because they also believe that while this lot only provides about 70 parking spaces, that it may, you know, it's ultimately not going to be enough. And so their fear is, okay, we're putting this Band-Aid on a situation that's, you know, it's going to be a lot larger in the future. And that's really just what I wanted to speak to. And from that, I guess we'll just hear the rest. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Henry. Now, Thank is you. there a question for the Councilman? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ewing, members of the board. My name is Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street. I represent Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Parish. Uh, with me here today on my right is, um, is Flor Meglar and Miguel Torres. They are both on the pastoral and finance committee with the church. Uh, they've essentially been our point of contact with our client. And on my left here is Jay Fulmer. Um, this actually began a year ago, about, about, uh, about a year ago, September, when the church filed an application to come before this board and that application was scheduled for a hearing i think in november and there was a fair amount of opposition to that and they were also at that time asking for some variances uh, in their site plan and they decided to withdraw that application and retool and restart and and they decided to hire mr fulmer and his his uh, able staff to prepare a site plan that does not require any variances. So there's no variances being requested uh, with respect to this parking lot. Uh, in our zoning code, your zoning code, uh, there's a section that addresses off-site parking specifically for religious institutions or place of worship. And in there, there are 10 factors that this board is to consider as a, as a special exception. And I've uh, listed those on the front page of my letter to you dated July 3. Uh, that was delivered and hopefully distributed to you. I know we've had a holiday this week. Uh, uh, unless, unless you feel necessary, I'm going to skip going through each no, of these. No, we have the letter. Thank you. Okay. So we, we certainly submit that this parking lot site meets each of these criteria, uh, each of these 10 criteria. And as you heard from Councilman Mike Freeman, uh, there, were been, uh, there was a meeting in April, and we had another follow-up meeting with neighbors last week. There was about eight folks in attendance at both meetings. And uh, I think what you're going to hear from, from the opposition, and the church certainly recognizes that uh, the church has really become a victim of its own success. There's quite a bit, been quite a growth in its membership. And so parking uh, has been a demand that has been on the increase. And so they, uh, they have off-site parking in a commercial piece of property. They've utilized off-site parking at the local school, Glencliff High School. Uh, Councilman Freeman has uh, been willing to uh, assist in reaching out to the school board to see if even additional parking can be secured through cooperative arrangements uh, with Metro Public Schools. But in terms of this particular site plan, um, I'll turn it now over to Mr. Fulmer to explain to you exactly what's being proposed and its proximity on the site. Uh, my name is Jay Fulmer, 2002 Richard Jones Road. Uh, the proposed lot is uh, directly across from the existing parking lot that's serving Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, we're intending to, to meet all the sidewalk regulations uh, that, are, that are currently enacted. Uh, to meet the perimeter landscaping requirements, we'll have buffers on each side and, and planting requirements. Uh, and also to provide a, a crosswalk for pede uh, pedestrian connectivity across the street. Um, it is owned by, the, the property is currently owned by the church and there's a, a residential structure that's on one of the parcels. Um, so it is, it is something they've owned for, for quite a while. Uh, we have an aerial map that also shows the other uh, places that they're utilizing for parking. 
uh, Glencliff High School is, is noted, it's further down Antioch Pike. Uh, Wright Middle School could be an opportunity, uh, but there's nothing secured in writing uh, for permission to park at either of those. Uh, Advance Auto has, has given some verbal permission to use their lot, but there's nothing in, in writing there. And then the, the Thus Avenue lot is one that they do own that is commercially zoned. Um, they're trying to, in the future, see about putting some sort of a parking structure there as well, but the current, the current parcels aren't big enough. Uh, that would require acquisition of, of one they don't own. Um, it, and you can also note, you know, while it is the entry to the neighborhood, I, I think it is valuable to understand the sawtooth nature of the commercial properties that are up and down Nolansville and how this does not necessarily get out of context with the, the depth and encroachment into the actual neighborhoods. Uh, but we'll be happy to answer any further questions you may have. So I have a quick question. Uh, I know that uh, the, the parking counts required by code are I find when, when dealing with churches are usually underestimated of the actual use. I think it's two and a half, three cars, or it, people per car, something like that? One car per six seats. Per six. In the sanctuary in the urban zoning overlay. So, wow, that's a lot. Uh, how, what would you, what are, what is the parking condition now? Are they meeting code, and is this strictly uh, to, to meet demand? Uh, it, it is more to meet demand. The report done by planning indicated uh, approximately 150 required spaces. Uh, it it kind of depends on how you count the sanctuary. They're using more than just the actual official sanctuary is sanctuary space because they have such high demand. Uh, we believe that the, the demand is closer to 300. Um, the actual zoning requirement could be in between 150, 175, depending on how you categorize the sanctuary. So their existing lot parks 107. This would put them at closer to 177, uh, depending if all 70 spaces are, are able to be yielded. The, the site plan we did was based on GIS and we will have to get a field run survey and go through all approvals. Um, so it, it'll put us very close to zoning code, if not slightly above, but still far less than the actual demand that they have to support their religious practice. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, the planning recommendation, they recommended disapproval, and have you read that? Uh, we have read it, and the way that the policy reads, I, I wish that I had spent more time looking at the policy. If you go back to, if John Michael, if you don't mind going back to the GIS map that you showed previously that has the zoning, I'm not sure if the planning policy follows that zoning zigzag line. Um, you can see that, that our, these three parcels line up with the parking lot in the back of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and if it had followed more of the uh, commercial, the OR20 and the CL zoning, as well as this PUD zoning, I'm not sure if that would have changed their opinion, uh, but I'm assuming that it follows the back of the properties that face Nolensville Pike. And they, I don't believe that planning received uh, any kind of parking analysis. And, you know, we had discussed the parking with Public Works and they took no exception. The way they're stating it is that that's a requirement of the appellant to provide the traffic study. Right. Study. And, and why didn't you all provide that? We provided parking breakdowns to Public Works directly. That's why they took no exception and didn't have a comment on it. If I may add to that, uh, our client delivered directly uh, to staff on Monday this, what, what they've captioned as a mass services and parking slash members um, document. It's three pages. This is the parking study. Sure. And that's the one that talks about security too? Correct. This, this highlights where they're parking on the various lots, how many spaces are on Thus Avenue. And, but the staff did not have the benefit of seeing that. So, so Councilman Friedman, how did the meeting go and what you all talk about? I mean, the meeting went uh, it went as well as could be expected with the opposition that we have. We have some that are, you know, that are just in the trenches, no. Um, then I believe we do have some members who are willing to, you know, to to work and, um, and you know, to work with the church and make 
I guess make concessions if you will, and I guess that's one question I have for the board. Is there, um, because runoff has been, you know, people talk about the runoff, uh, the storm water. Is there a possibility of, is it in this board's, uh, is it purview to require non-permeable or permeable surfaces to not go with uh, just straight blacktop? Is that within your view and to, and to increase the uh, buffer? The zoning code requires hard surface, and it doesn't address whether permeable or imper impermeable. It just says hard surface. But I guess what the council person said is, is can we say you have to have permeable surfaces or different surfaces as, as granting such a request? I mean, I guess you could impose that condition because, I mean, those would be hard surfaces and consistent, so. Okay. Doesn't um, Metro Stormwater need to look at this for permitting reasons and they could address the stormwater concerns or? So if a, an application for a permit isn't made, stormwater will be tracked on it and they will look at it and review it under their regulations. Anything else to add, Mr. Henry? We certainly would like to reserve whatever time we have sure, remaining rebuttal. for rebuttal. And I've checked with my client, and my client has no problem with your approval being conditioned upon a uh, pervious surface. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from the opposition, and um, then you'll get 10 minutes and 23 seconds for a rebuttal. So all those who are in opposition to this case, now is your time to speak and come forward. Please identify yourself for the record, press the button, and let your time has begun. Press the button. button. Press this button, the lower button that says speak. Okay. okay. My name is Margaret Pollard and I live at 306 Sunrise Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only one here today. Uh, we on, on Sunrise between that first block, Nolansville Road, and the next street down, there's only four houses there that are owner occupied and one of them happens to be moving in today. Mm -hmm. um, my neighbor thought maybe he could come, but he couldn't. The other one's- How long have you lived on Sunrise? Pardon? How long have you lived there? I moved there in 2012 when I, re when I retired. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not opposed to the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think they probably have done, have added some things to our neighborhood that we didn't have before. What I keep, I'm opposed to the traffic. 70 parking lots doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 70 parking lots four times a day on Sunday. That's 240 cars going in and out of that lot. The church lot is on the other side of the street, and you've got cars coming in and out of there. We have a high-rise apartment complex, which you can see right there on the building. At least I think that's it. Um, yes. The high-rise also has a street, I mean a driveway onto Sunrise Avenue. They have one onto the next street, the one that crosses in front of the tower, and one thus. Thus has a parking lot that is used by the church. So we have a constant flow of traffic now around the church. Sometimes we cannot get out of our driveways. Um, we're going to be adding all of these additional cars just Sunday alone. Easter was a week long, seven days. We had traffic problems. We have celebrations that start on Friday and end on Sunday. Um, it's just impossible to get, it's a lot of cars in that one little neighborhood. Um, it's also residential. The property immediately behind the parking lots floods whenever we have a heavy rainstorm. We look like we have a river running through there. Most of those storm drains, the storm lines there, because my son used to live behind there, have big holes in them and the water just flows up through them. Um, but my major concern is the traffic. Um, we have to back out of the driveway, get in line, and wait to get to the stop sign, and wait to get to Antioch Pike. Um, one day a week probably wouldn't be so bad, but it's a good percentage of the time. So that's my opposition to it, not to the church, but to sure. the 
to the enormous amount of transportation. Any questions for the opposition? Do, I don't even know if this is possible. I just want to ask so I can ask the appellant as well. Uh, if, if the parking lot were only available to them on certain days at certain times, would that make a difference, do you I, think? I don't know. When we met in the fall about the, about the parking situation, the church was requesting one of these lots, the variance for one lot, because they said that would take care of their need. Um, I understand from the, I did not attend this lawyer's meeting because I did not get my meeting notice until I got home late that afternoon. It was the next day and I, when I got there, the meeting was over. Um, but at the other meeting, apparently the church has grown to over 3,000 members. But it's not just that the people are from other areas, you know, other counties, but when they have big celebrations, we see cars from Arizona, and not Arizona, but Texas, Arkansas, Alabama. Um, I, it's just really a problem to get in and out of the neighborhood. That's my major complaint. Um, is that, you know, I try to time my, my leaving the house on Sunday between church services. Do you think having someone direct traffic helps? They actually do a really good job of that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, they really do. Uh, they do a good job, of, but there's just such a volume of traffic. And I'm willing to help them. We mentioned at the meeting we, two meetings ago that we would be more than happy to have a committee and look at some other alternatives. We certainly don't want them leaving the neighborhood. I mean, they do to go home after church, but but we want them to be, <laughs> you know. Um, I just think that there has to, maybe needs to be a better long-term solution because I think this church will continue to grow. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for being here. Okay. And we'll have the applicant come back forward in 10 minutes and 23 seconds left. So, Mr. Henry, um, four services on Sunday, obviously lots of cars coming in and out. Um, you've presented your traffic plan. The opposition said that you do a good job of directing, but there's just a lot of cars. So what else can we do here? Yeah, that, that is hard to respond to, except um, we do have a letter from Doug Jones, who's the on-track security uh, company that provides police, um, you know, off-duty police, uh, traffic control service every Sunday. They have police officers there on site from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Sunday. But you're right, uh, the church is uh, available for use uh, throughout throughout uh, Sunday on several so events. I imagine there's a traffic light on Nolensville Road at the end of the street. No. There isn't? No, there's not. Oh. So when you, when you direct traffic, are you directing traffic onto Nolensville Road or just out of the parking lots? Thus, from where the sanctuary is. Sorry. Yes. On thus, mm -hmm. that's where it's being directed to, to the commercial lot. But it's not being directed out to Nolensville Road. So, do you think it would be helpful if you had some councilman? Your this is your district. If someone, if we had someone directing them out of the parking lot and then you know, every now and then stopping traffic and letting a lot of cars go out on Nolensville Road, would that help? Push my button as well. I think, that'd be, I think that would serve well, um, especially if we know when, you know, if we know specifically, you know, church lets out 9.15, mm -hmm. we'll say, then we, you know, if we had uh, traffic calming right there in front of Knowles Road or somebody to stop that just that one lane and let say, like right a minute turn, of cars go through right and just make it right turn only and just funnel them right out yeah. that, that probably would help getting I don't them know off the of the rules about having a you know do you need a metro officer can I just a volunteer and security person that, do that, that would I don't be, know I mean I, I know we see it throughout the city at, at large churches yeah, they'll sure. shut down so I don't, I don't know what the protocol is but I think that would definitely help and you know if this lot were proposed and was built then we could just 
off that lot into their main lot, yeah, their main Ms. lot or Because Mr. Henry, as you know, I mean, if you dump them out on this one street, but then Nolansville is the major street and it's hard to kind of pull out and if someone's turning left, but if you had just had someone kind of stopping traffic and, you know, you're, the opposition said that you do a good job of directing, but it's just still, you know, so what do you think about possibilities of looking into Nolansville Road as far as a, another way to kind of get people in and out there quicker? Uh, I think that makes perfect sense and I'd really like for Mr. Torres to, to respond to that as well. Mr. Torres. Yes, I, I think that uh, will be something that uh, we could, you know, uh, manage and um, even if we have to have extend the, the security to direct the traffic and mm -hmm. I think that's something that will really work uh, well today. I don't think we uh, direct the traffic to the big mm -hmm. avenue and that certainly causes a, a problem in the neighborhood. But uh, that will be a small change that uh, will help a lot uh, both yeah. ways, I guess. You know, our city in the last 15, 20 years dealing with prof professional sports, the Predators, the Titans, and everyone trying, to, tens of thousands of people trying to get out and go in the same direction at the same time, we've done a great job of kind of one-way streets and directing people and having officers at boxes regulating the traffic light and during CMA Fest and fireworks at there should be a kind of more manageable solution. It seems like, you know, you already have people out there. I think maybe another person might help be helpful for actual Nolansville Road. Yeah, um, we actually do have a ministry where we have people, uh, volunteers to help direct the traffic along with uh, what the uh, security officer. But they're, not on, no, but they're not I, on Nolan's Road. I understand, but they're not in, yeah. in, 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 in Nolan'sville. But yeah, I think we can do a better job. A small change will make a big well, difference. Well, it sounds like you're doing a great job right now, but there's just so many cars. But I, I think know. just, Nolan, if you had someone on the major street, I think that would make a world of difference too and get the cars out of there even quicker. Yeah. Okay. Councilman, what do you think about that? Well, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, we still have to address the parking issue, but as far sure. as, like, you know, what they've said as far as getting the cars, because, I mean, when you drive by, I mean, they stack them as tight as they can and facing, you know, I mean. So it's like New York style parking. They, that, they know, are the doing. Tiny little parking lot. <laughs> they're maximizing every inch of that parking lot. And I think, you know, like we said, if we could funnel everybody into that main parking lot and then out onto Nolansville Road and make sure that, you know, you can only go right, right turn only. Mm -hmm. and just get them out. I think that, you know, that would definitely help. Other questions? Okay. Anything else to add, Mr. Henry? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I glossed over an important uh, mm -hmm. fact that I think some of the opposition would appreciate to know, but on June 1st, uh, the church representatives met with Solomon Builders to evaluate the cost of constructing a new parking garage, parking deck, on their existing parking lot on Thus Avenue. And that's something that they're, that is still in their plan. They can't afford to do so now, but the long-term objective is to get a parking structure on Thus that will accommodate a lot of the traffic that uh, we're hearing about today. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question with Council Member Freeman. Uh, we're asked to rezone those two lots as commercial lots. I did not hear the opposition, the one person in opposition, saying that she was opposed to that. How do you feel about that? What's your recommendation on that, on what we're asked to do today? I believe it's my understanding that the lots will still be zoned RS. It's just they're asking for, I guess it's a variance, or I'm not, I'm not sure what the nomenclature is, variance or exception to just build the structure. It was my understanding it stays RS. Okay. But, you know, they, the neighbors still feel that, you know, once it's a parking lot, it's always going to be a parking lot. Okay. And so maybe if, you know, if there were exceptions or, you know, conditions applied, you know, increased uh, screening, and, you know, that might, you know, go a long way to sage, you know, put, put people at ease. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I have a, a quick question. Sure. Uh, for Mr. Fulmer. Uh, planning mentioned the two curb cuts, I believe there are. Is that correct? Do you, uh, is there any advantage or disadvantage to two curb cuts versus versus one? Uh, we can, uh, we're not adamant on one or the other. It was more about potentially getting people in and out, um, but if it is better to consolidate down to one, then that's... I, I don't I, know that that's completely what, I mean, I, well, I know it's not completely what mm -hmm. their recommendation hinges on. I, I just kind of wanted to hear uh, from your point of view. Um, I, I know churches 
uh, a lot of the traffic and and the parking problems are it's in the turnover it's not no, I mean, everybody I, shows up in the morning everybody leaves at night i it's, think how creative they've been with their parking i think they need all the help yeah, to I, enter I the lot so i would not recommend no I, and i'm not recommending i just want i just wanted to find out if uh, if you had an opinion on that we, we should too just for ease of access but that'll definitely be something that public works will weigh in on when we go through permitting Okay. Anything else, board members? Anything else? The only other comment is they're installing a code compliant sidewalk, so you're not going to be seeing a variance there. We, so we, we love, love sidewalks. Winter sidewalks today. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. And Just same curbing. <laughs> okay, what do we think? If everybody walks to church, you won't need any more parking, correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I think, I actually do like the idea of an extra person on Nolensville Road. I think that would take care of a lot, or not a lot, but some of the issues, um, as the opposition said, you know, they do a good job of directing traffic. There's just so many cars. So I imagine there's more bottleneck of people just trying to turn left, turn right on Nolensville Road. So if they even had someone on a Sunday just kind of stopping traffic every now and then just to get the flow out. and. I think that would work. So does anyone have a recommendation? Motion. Mr. Harper. Um, uh, I'll, I move that we approve the special exception and uh, do, you get, do you guys want to make a make it a condition to have the uh, well, traffic control on Nolensville? Well, I think they should definitely have the traffic control out of the parking lot. They should work with the council person and the police department or however traffic works to come up with a additional solution we can say. I'll, I'll move that we grant the special exception uh, with the uh, condition that the appellant uh, work with the council person and, and codes to come up with a, a viable uh, Solution traffic control on, 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 no one's road. Road, on no one's road, yes. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck with everything. Thank you. With that, passing 5-0, we'll move on to the next case, number 2017-126. I would note for the board that the one case that was recommended for consent agenda and originally pulled off has now been resolved after conversation among those who had concerns about the project. That was case number 2017-167, involving a variance request from the letter of the landscape buffer requirements. The property is at 1041A East Trinity Lane. That item is appropriate to be taken up for consent agenda. I would solicit a board vote at this time. We will put one case 167 back on consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 167, back on consent, passes. Very well. Mr. Chairman, case 2017-126 involves the property located at 4100 Phil Hall Parkway. Ms. Kim Patterson Rummage is the appellant. Ms. Calpurnia Weathersby is the owner of the subject property. This is located out in Council District Number 33, just off Smith Springs Road in the R10 Zoning District. The request is for a special exception to allow a group daycare home. Your uh, board packet outlines the specifics of the case, which is, of course, guided by the zoning code at Section 17.16.170, Section C, I believe, D. As the aerial shows here, the subject property, the uh, Phil Hall Parkway is the street to the lower right-hand portion and Smith Springs to the upper right-hand portion. The site plan submitted gives a general layout of the subject property and the concrete drive that enters in. From my somewhat recent uh, site visit out to the face of the property here and the views up and down the street, uh, Phil Hall Parkway there on the left, upper and lower, and then directly across the street in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, because there is opposition present, the appellant will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, if you wish to save some portion of that time for rebuttal, please save it out of this original 15 minutes. Please come forward and introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board. Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, my name is Kimberly 
Patterson Rummage. Uh, my address is 4100 Phil Hall Parkway. Um, I'm new to the area. Um, my desire um, has always been a close affinity to children. I've always wanted to help my community in some form or fashion. Um, currently, um, daycare expense for some of my single mothers. I do currently have um, four kids that are related to me and then four kids non-related. Um, commercial daycare is just too expensive for them. I understand that some of my neighbors are, or the ones that are here are opposed to it. I've heard various reasons, traffic, um, it'll give the neighborhood a commercial feel. Um, my kids that I desire to take care of are just infants to three years old. Um, my driveway will support the traffic. I mean, there won't, will never be parking on the street. Um, people will just drive directly into my turnaround driveway. And I have a room that's dedicated just for the children. It's a large room. I did bring additional pictures of my daycare room, if I can interest you in that. So this is the driveway that we're looking at right now? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you have to turn around? It doesn't just loop around? It loops around, right. Oh, it does, okay. Without having to turn around? The parents can go um, where the hedges are. They just go there and they can actually turn around. There's enough space to turn around. But there's only one entrance and one exit? Yes. Okay. Continue. Um, Currently, right now, I do not have a council person for 33. We're in the process of electing one. I'd actually, um, I did have my community meeting. Um, a lot of neighbors did not understand exactly what I was wanting to do. Um, the people that did show up, some were still angry or opposed to it, and other people, you know, said they were not decided. Um, I'd ask for it to be deferred since I actually don't have a council person right now. Do you want to, I mean, is, are you asking for it to be deferred? I'd like to have that support of a, of a council person. Um, Just I, sitting Ms. here. Ms. Sanford, uh, you're very familiar with Southeast Nashville, and this is Mr. Coleman, Sam Coleman, now Judge Coleman's old district. I do think it's a reasonable request to have a council person involved, particularly when there's a lot of opposition. What do you think about this particular case? I ha I'm kind of caught off guard. I, I oh, didn't I'm know sorry. she was going to ask for a oh, okay. deferral. That I would have no problem with us deferring the case if that, and we will have the election on August 15th. So yeah, I mean, part that. of the special extension process. So when you had your meeting, had Councilman Coleman become a judge by then? Um, when I had my community meeting? Yes. yes. And so there was literally nobody there. There was no, I had no support, right? There was no one there. Yeah, I mean, <sighs> board members, what do we think? Because the, the reason that we have these special exception meetings and we have the council person there, particularly if there's opposition, to try to see what they can work out and get things done. If the applicant wants to defer, then they should be able to defer. Okay. Right. Do we know when the elections will be uh, yes. or not? August 15th. And when will they be seated? Um, immediately thereafter, I assume. I have, okay. un well, wait, there yeah. could be a long delay. If no candidate of the four declared candidates win 50% plus one, there will be a runoff, and I suppose that will run into September. Yes. So it could be quite a while. But, you know, four people, maybe, I don't know. So what, what, what would you like to do? Would you like to defer? It sounds like you want to defer. I think um, just sitting here, I realize the importance of having a council mm -hmm. member. Um, and I feel like in order for me to have a fair shot, because I, I am aware there's so much opposition. Yes. Um, and to me, it doesn't seem like the opposition is for a daycare. It just seems... Out of other okay, selfish well, if, reasons. If you, want to, if you want to defer, you have that. Um, you can ask for a deferral. So, is there a motion? I'll make the motion to defer the case until a time that um, we have works a... for the applicant. Okay. Thank and you. And is there a second? No, second. Motion's been made to properly second and to defer this case. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Yeah. Uh, Okay, no, it's not deferred. I do want to n note, because I know that it seems like there are a lot of people here in opposition to this case. If you're here in opposition to this case, please raise your hand. Okay, 
So we have, it looks like, about 16, 17, maybe 20 people in opposition to this case. So um, what we have voted to do today is defer this case until, and maybe this will be a campaign issue, who knows. Um, the four people that are running, uh, one of those people is gonna be your duly elected council people. So when we have that, you know, the person really has a right to have a council person, and, you're, and you all too, to kind of um, look at these cases and bring the sides together and, and make a stance, because one of the reasons we give a lot of credibility to your council person is, this is someone that's campaigned and knocked on th hundreds if not thousands of doors and know the issues of the district. So uh, we want that person to tell us what's going on and what the best thing for your district is. So that is why we have done this today. We appreciate you being here for such a long meeting, but we're, like I said, we will probably see you in the future. There will be another, uh, the, the other thing that I would request as far as the motion, if it's not already clear, that you have another public meeting when you have the, the elected council person uh -huh. and that we send out notice again so people can weigh in with the new council person. Is that acceptable? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you and yes. Can I ask a question? Of course. I don't believe that we've got any kind of notice for this meeting. This meeting, this meeting was previously done. noticed on its originally scheduled date. No new notice is required every time they merely defer to a later date. That deferral was in accommodation for the neighborhood meeting, which was also separately noticed. So no, you did not. You're correct. But legally, you weren't required to receive a new one. You will not be legally required to receive a new one. We anticipate that this will be at its earliest, the first meeting in September, which I believe is Thursday, September the 7th, after a new district council member is seated and a community meeting takes place. However, if the appellant goes through with the requirement and does the next uh, neighborhood meeting, that will have its own notice, thus yeah. putting you on notice for the upcoming BZA yeah. meeting. You'll have a neighborhood meeting notice, and then at the neighborhood meeting, hopefully by then, they'll say, we'll come back in front of this group at a certain time. But our agendas are all online, Nashville.gov, look under the Board of Zoning Appeals, so in advance you can see what we do. Okay? Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to come before the board is case number 2017-151. This was discussed at the outset of our meeting with Council Member Weathers. Is Ms. Rebecca Devane present in the assembly today? Ms. Devane. This is the second consecutive meeting where the appellant has not been present for the BZA appeal regarding the denial of a short-term rental permit based upon prior operation without the legally required permit. The staff would remind the board that they are allowed to defer if they wish. They are allowed to take up a motion to dismiss the appeal if they wish. I'll, uh, it's okay with the board. I'll, I'll move that we dismiss the appeal. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded to dismiss the appeal. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of dismissing um, this appeal signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2017-152. Garrett Bjork, the appellant and owner of the property at 603 South 20th Street, is requesting variances from front and rear setback requirements, and I believe also side setback requirements, although we'll let Mr. Bjork address that in the RS5 zoning district for the construction of a new single family residence. You also heard from council member Withers on this subject as the property is not only in district six, but right up against the edge of Shelby Park. The aerial photograph here shows the presently undeveloped lot and its uh, condition vis-a-vis -vis the neighboring residential properties. The site plan submitted shows the proposed setbacks here with the reduction to the front setback and the rear setback, and I believe also a reduction on the non-alley side setback as well. From my recent site visit, the uh, undeveloped property is in a very undeveloped state, as you can see. The view up and down 20th Street um, on the left hand upper and lower photographs gives you a sense of the topography of the lot. This is a steep hill going back toward the park and away from Long Avenue, I think it is. And then the view directly across the street to a still undeveloped lot that the board took up a few months ago with regard to some variances. With that, is there any opposition present to case number 152? There is. Therefore, the appellant will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Please save whatever time you wish for rebuttal, and then we'll hear from the uh, opponents after this original presentation. And if the opponents, when they start, can speak to what the council person said, you were here when he addressed the issues. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Bjork, if you would introduce yourself by name and address and then make the desired presentation. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. My name is Garrett Bjork, 3907 East Ridge Drive. 
37211. We're here to clarify a few things about the variance for, to the proposed setbacks. Um, this lot was subdivided off the back portion of an existing lot. The total length of this lot plus the previous lot that it was divided off of is equivalent to the rest of the lots in the neighborhood. So this lot has already some uh, extenuating circumstances in that it is about half the size of the, the other lots in the area. When was it subdivided? Uh, that subdivision was happened prior to, well, I'm not sure of the exact date, but that happened prior to any of involvement with these parties. And how much was the property bought for and when? How much was the property bought, bought for? Please, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Sandra Hale, and mm -hmm. I am owner of the property. Um, the property was purchased in, I believe, October of 2016 from Mr. Donaldson, who had planned to build a residence on there, and he had um, gotten zoning, these same setbacks approved previously. From this board? Yes. And how much did you pay for this lot? I paid 170000 for this lot. Okay. So these setbacks, um, the, the equivalent to this presentation was already made and approved by the BZA. Um, at, at the time of Ms. Hale's purchase of the property, the contractor, builder, previous developer who decided not to build, I failed to inform her that his two-year um, BZA approval period before per pulling permits was less than 30 days from coming due. So she brought the, bought the property, and in the time that she was putting together her construction documents and preparing for permitting, that time had elapsed. And so that's what brings us back here today with the same requests. We've actually uh, reduced the size of the building footprint and shrunk the residence from the previously um, proposed residence from the last approval from this BZA. Um, a lot of several of the concerns that Councilman Withers mentioned that uh, the community was concerned about that we'd like to address, uh, I believe they're all simple misunderstandings. Um, there was some concern that the five-foot front setback was a five-foot setback off of the street. Uh, I've attached a diagram for you guys entitled BZA 1.3, Proposed Setback Context, showing the location of this house in comparison to all the other building footprints in the area. Uh, the proposed residence will actually be 24 and a half feet off of the street, not just five feet off of the street. Hopefully that will clear that up and be helpful. Um, also off of the alley. Um, there are only th three out of these eight properties that have alley access. There are only three currently using the alley for parking access. Um, the rest of them have driveways off of the primary street in front of their house. The primary street in front of our lot is actually a side street for everyone else. And we have significant topography issues, as you probably have seen in that uh, the images from Mr. John Michael. The topography on this street drops a full 10 feet from front to back just within our property boundary. But then as you progress closer to the street on South 20th Street, it actually um, increases in elevation an additional five feet as the road, or that embankment gets steeper to accommodate the roadway. So the, pulling a driveway in off of South 20th Street is, I mean, it would be very difficult. And it seemed like a much better option for construction purposes as well as for traffic flow purposes to come in off the alley as indicated on that site plan and the proposed uh, context there. Um, that was one of the other concerns that Mr. Oh, how is that a misunderstanding? Because Councilman Withers basically said you should come in through the alley. If that's what he said, that I misunderstood. I thought that he was saying we should not come in through the alley and instead. No, we I'm, talking, I'm talking about. I'm sorry. You're right. He should not come through the alley, and you want to come through the alley. So how is that a misunderstanding? The misunderstanding was that how close the building was going to be to the alleyway, and then it was going to make for a difficult traffic patterns, and, and that somebody had made the assumption that there was going to be a fence on the property line, which would inhibit the, the view angle of somebody mm -hmm. exiting the alleyway. We had never made any proposition of a fence or uh, of encroaching any closer to the alleyway. Um, as you can see, our structure will begin 
the proposed structure would begin 13.4 feet from the alleyway. If, where if you didn't enter through the alley, you talked about topography on the street, how would you get to this lot? It would be incredibly difficult. You'd have to have substantial structure built. Uh, the grading of that driveway would be either incredibly steep or you'd have to build up your driveway and have an elevated parking pad off the street and then steps to walk down to your residence. So it would, in some people's opinion, it would be much more detrimental to the okay. like, feel of the neighborhood. Sure. Okay. Uh, right now, the, the intention is to only have the building footprint to take up less than 50% of the site area, leaving plenty of room for uh, vegetation and uh, like replanting of, per the tree code although there are no substantial trees on the lot presently. Um, the height restriction um, or the height concerns that people were having that we would build uh, a monstrosity, we're more than happy to accommodate the 35 foot height limit. That's already uh, been addressed and I'm not sure why somebody thought we were going to, to build higher than that. But in addition to the 35 foot height limit being already taken into consideration, the fact that the roadway drops or from the elevation at the road to the elevation at the front door is about 10 feet below uh, the roadway. A 35 foot tall house is going to seem like a 25 foot tall house and I don't think it'll be uh, any more substantial than in many of the other much larger homes in the area. Uh, the, the concern about the future sidewalks and being unable to build future sidewalks with a five foot front setback. Um, front in our case is different than everybody else. Everybody else has a five foot side setback. We're just asking for a five foot front setback because their side is the same as our front. So our context would be the same. Uh, in relationship to the contextual setback, which pr like dominates most of the uh, setback, uh, probably setback variances that you hear about or um, mo in most cases that I've seen, the z base zoning setback is less restrictive than the contextual setback. And so if you take the same contextual setback idea and off of South 20th Street and you look at the, the neighbor to the north is 26.4 feet, the neighbor to the south is 20.8 feet, it puts us right in the middle there on that contextual line. So we wouldn't be any closer or farther than anybody else on that street. It would, the average would be approximately the same. Also, the building footprint is in keeping with the, the size of the additional properties on the street. You can see that in exhibit BZA 1.3. Okay. So is this, uh, there's a, a three-dimensional drawing, uh, I think in a letter from Ms. Hale. Is, is that the, the house you're planning on building? Yeah, that's a, a proposed concept. We've got preliminary construction documents drawn and that um, we, we have shared with the members of the community at the meeting. And uh, in no way are those finalized. Like We would love to use those drawings, but we can make any adaptations as necessary. But from the comments that Mr. Withers made, it didn't seem that any of those concerns would actually be required with our current design. Uh, all they needed was explanation. And uh, so the the neighbor that is directly north of you, the the other half of this once single property. Mm -hmm. uh, have you talked to them? What, what is their position on this, uh, Ms. Hale? Uh, we put the flyers out in the immediate vicinity. I personally went over there and I haven't heard anything from that particular person. Any other questions? Okay, if you don't have anything to add, we're gonna hear from the opposition and you'll have up to 10 minutes and 43 seconds left for rebuttal. Great. Okay? Thank Let's you. hear from the opposition. Please come forward. And when you get here, please state your name and address for the record. And turn on your mics by pressing that bottom button where it says speak. Yes. 
My name is Karen Knox. I live at 2005 Eastside Avenue, 37206. I'm speaking in opposition to this particular plan for several reasons. One of the chief ones is safety. The alley there is a dead end alley and there are um, currently six people, probably soon to be seven or eight because there's new construction going up along that alley as we speak. Um, the sight lines out of the alley are already obstructed by the growth of bamboo that you may have seen in the, in the photographs. Um, but for those of us who use the alley to get to garages in the back or from, from the back um, to keep us from parking on the street, is it's a little iffy. Um, early in the morning, although I don't go out at rush hour, it's um, not pretty. Um, so the safety concern with alley sight lines is, is a big one. Another concern is building density in our neighborhood um, of Shelby Hills. Um, the house just to the north that someone asked about, uh, the north of the lot, has just been sold. Um, I don't know who owns it now or what's going to happen with it, um, but it seems to me unwise to permit a building of the size proposed on what is less than half a lot. I don't think it's to the community's benefit, and that's chiefly what I want to speak about. The reason that there are no trees, uh, or there's only, I think, one small one still left, is that the owner who had the lot before um, Ms. Hale, <coughs> excuse me, Ms. Hale, uh, cut down a couple of them. So that's why there aren't any there. Um, And that's it. I'm done. Okay. May I ask you about your comment about the alley? Um, yes. Do the people on the both sides of the alley, do you come out of driveways from your backyards and yes. go into the alley? And, yes. Okay. My name is Thomas Knox, and I'm a property owner at 2005 East Side Avenue. Um, <clears throat> our property is located within 600 feet and diagonally across the alley from uh, 603 South 20th Street, uh, where the setback variances have been requested. I oppose the variance request as it, cur as it currently stands. The property at uh, 603 South 20th Street is a lot which is less than half the size of all other lots in the surrounding neighborhood. South 20th Street is a short uh, two block long uh, cross street and has no other houses uh, in that two block area which actually face on to 20th Street. All other houses that adjoin 20th Street adjoin on the side only. Uh, the lot dimensions are 50 feet deep by 68 feet wide <clears throat> on the street side, in other words, uh, facing 20, uh, uh, 20th Street, the lot is 68 feet wide with a 50-foot depth. Um, the uh, requested setbacks, as I understand them, would provide for um, about a 2,200 uh, square foot buildable area footprint within the total 3,400 uh, 3, square foot area of the lot. Um, and this is a far greater structure to land ratio than uh, virtually any other house in the area. Um, uh, most lots in the area are as has been mentioned, a standard 150-foot uh, depth by 50 feet wide um, with, a, with a total um, lot area of 7,500 square feet. And they mostly adhere to the standard setbacks for this particular zoning area. May, may I interrupt you to sure. get your question answered? I had the same question about the 2,200 square feet and wanted to ask the zoning staff about that. I read in the permit application that they were limited to a footprint, building footprint of about 1,700 square feet. And so if we granted all these requests, certainly they could not exceed the 1,700 square foot buildable um, building envelope, I guess. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, 
I, I do understand and accept that, that this is a buildable lot, even though it is smaller than what would normally be uh, permitted today. Uh, the requested variance, as I understand it, is for a, a five-foot setback from 20th Street, and I, I'm having trouble visualizing where, the, where this so-called extra 20 feet that they're talking about comes from. It, it, it seems to me that there's the edge of the street, which is their, their, their property line, and that the setback is five foot from, from that particular point. So I don't quite see how those, how those numbers add up with, a, with only a five foot setback from, uh, from 20th Street. Well, the, the property line isn't necessarily at the, at the street. Uh, so that's that's confusing. Sometimes you, sometimes there's there's more right of way for the uh, for the street than you know the grass may go to the street, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's all their uh, their property. If that makes sense. Yeah. Can, okay. Yes. Okay. I I understand that. But but does that when determining a front setback? Uh, it, it, is it not from the the, the street line to the, the, the it's from the, the property line? Would you like to see the survey they had done? Would that be helpful to you? Uh, there's one that's stamped that might be more clear. Yeah. If you'd like to come here, I'll give you the one in my packet. Ah. That would be this is all we have. Yeah. Okay. All we were sent as, a, as residents were just one. Oh, please paper. press the button and identify yourself sure. and address for the record. Uh, Jack Cook at 2008 Long Avenue. I'm at the dead end of Long Avenue, and I've been there about 30 years mm -hmm. um, here in support of uh, against the variance with these two. Okay, so what is so uh, what's objectionable to you about this variance? Request? The objection that I'm uh, that I have is basically that we were sent a piece of paper by the uh, owner, mm -hmm. the, the new owner, and all she included on that was a 3D representation of what might go there. So all we had to go on at the time was that 3D representation. Uh, we had a house very similar to it right up the street around 17th, I believe it was, of uh, Shelby. But uh, since we've been there, sorry, go ahead. Since we've been there, basically, uh, we've seen a lot of traffic increase in the alley behind where they're talking about. What's we, the what kind of traffic is that? Most of the traffic from individuals who are now living there in that particular okay, area. Okay, good, and there's a picture, and they basically use that alley as kind of a parking or entrance to their place as opposed to the city street. Ingress and egress. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll also notice that uh, there's a second house there that has just had people move into it that would be at 2003 I believe east side they now have two individuals probably with two trucks or cars that go, will will be going in and out of there on a frequent basis also we have an empty lot at the very end of the alley since it's a dead end lot that has not been built yet in fact this entire area as you're seeing it uh, is under development by somebody I mean there's two or three individuals who actually developed uh, houses in that area, and we're continuing to see these things. In fact, we were completely blindsided uh, because we didn't know what was going on when these things were beginning to be sold. We had no idea that so, so much development was happening in the area, and it completely surprised us when this particular property was split by its original owner. How long ago do you think that was? How long did I? Th I think it happened it around split. 2015, possibly earlier, because he he split the property to get about, I think it was 36,000 out of it. Uh, it has since had, I don't know, two or three owner, maybe even four more owners, uh, since he split the property. Okay. Uh, we think this is a bad investment. Uh, we don't want to see the variance. Uh, granted as is, we do realize there's a legality involved that we can't defeat. What, what are the objections for you about the setbacks? Uh, the setbacks, uh, mm -hmm. according to the um, information that we have, the setbacks are too small. 
there's just not enough room for the required greenery, trees, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. The same basic uh, objections that these individuals beside yeah, me have. One of those side setbacks is, is, is only three feet mm -hmm. from the adjacent uh, property, and then the rear setback is five feet. And sure. I mean, literally, this is putting the house in yeah, in, 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 in two, two different neighbors' backyards. Let me ask you a question about the use of the alley. You know, Councilperson's opposed to that, but everyone else seems to use the alley, right? You all use the alley. Even our next door neighbor uses it yeah. on occasion. So what's wrong with somebody else using the alley if everybody else is using the alley? Oh, it, that, that's not a problem. Um, the problem is being able to see out um, once you get to the end of the alley to turn whichever way on South 20th. And I'm afraid, even though uh, Mr. Bjork says that there is no proposed fence, mm -hmm. just because there isn't one proposed doesn't mean that one couldn't be put up later. I mean, it's a, it, okay. it's a serious concern, I think. Are you saying that the, if they build a house where they're proposing it, it's gonna impact the site views of the alley too? For this one, with the 24 and a half foot setback as it is, mm -hmm. probably not. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned that somebody will come along and put a fence, fence. up. Okay. We don't know what's gonna actually be built there. Sure. Questions for the opposition? Okay, do you have anything else to add? Okay, we appreciate you being here. We're gonna hear from the applicant again. Please come forward. Okay, time for rebuttal. Thank you all for your concern. We, we're happy to address all these issues. Those are good questions and we appreciate the opportunity. So uh, the alley site line question certainly don't want to cause any safety hazards. Um, the house as it's proposed at its nearest point is 24 and a half feet off of South Street, which is longer than um, any, well, I guess uh, an F-350 might be about 24 and a half feet long but giving you plenty of sight line, mm -hmm. um, although the sight lines and the fence even are not setback questions. Um, you can build Are you that. planning to build a fence? I'm not planning to, to build a fence. There's no fence in the construction plans, and, and that doesn't pertain actually in any way to the setbacks, but I'm, we're happy to Would make, you make agree it. to forego ever building a fence on that site? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Or at least uh, to abide by the the metro fence standards, any fence in front well, of the property, you're ha in front it has of, to be... Um, you're in front of us asking for a variance. Sure. And when you ask for something that the co code doesn't currently allow, we sometimes put criteria and restrictions on you. I totally understand. I was just kind of thinking more along the lines of somebody has uh, a pet dog and they want to have a I understand that see-through fence that's not going to obstruct any sight lines. Is mm -hmm. that because that's already in that fence code? It has to be, I think, 75% see-through if yes. it's in front of the house. So we certainly wouldn't, and I think less than four feet. Okay. Yeah. And we would abide by those standards anyway. Okay. And yeah, but we're not building one at the time. No privacy fences or anything like that. Okay. Um, as far as uh, the trees, I understand that lots of them have been cut down off that property over the last many years that we were not involved, but uh, we'll certainly replenish the vegetation as um, stipulated by the codes and standards. And we want this to be a beautiful property and, and enhance the neighborhood, and we're going to have lots of landscaping and, mm -hmm. and a courtyard area. We pr 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 the proposed what about plan. What about the setback issues? Why do you need to build within the setbacks so much? So the setbacks that are 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 actually um, the most restrictive. I don't know if you were able to see the BZA document 1.0. Um, if we were to show a front and rear setback in the the base zoning standard, that would be a 20 foot front setback and a 20 foot rear setback. Mm -hmm. and then a five foot side setback and a 10 foot on the alley side. So that gives us a 10 foot wide building envelope. And obviously not a possibility, but 
these setbacks, the five foot off of the front in this case, and the five foot off of the back are equivalent to all of the surrounding neighbors' side setbacks, which are five feet. So by giving us five feet off of the front, it's equivalent to a five foot side stack for all the neighbors, which they're using. Um, so we're not closer to the fence than they are, or farther, we're not in somebody's backyard any more than they would be in the neighbor's backyard. I'm sure you've seen people building up to their five foot side setbacks in many occasions. That's the equivalent of what we're doing. We're just calling the front by a different name. It's really the side, but it's called the front for us because we're facing 20th Street. The, the exception on the alley side, we're actually in keeping with the 10 foot setback there for that would be the case with any auxiliary building or garage. You wouldn't be able to, you can have an accessory building up to 10 feet off that rear property line as long as it has um, entry from the alleyway. And so that's what we're proposing off the alleyway as a carport to support uh, two vehicles parking in the carport and then one beside. So we'll have three off street, off alley parking spaces already accommodated on the site and not. Uh, we won't be planning on causing any traffic hazards by being parked on the street or in the alley. So you, you have a, with, with the proposed setbacks, you have a 2,200 square foot uh, footprint to work from, and, and what is the footprint you're proposing? Just over 15. It's about 1,550. Okay. So, um, yeah. Right. So the, and I, I wanted to clarify the the proposed setbacks. We could we could diagram just like in the case of an SP where, or an HPR type document where we were just, this is the footprint that we we're asking for. Mm -hmm. Can you approve this setback? Yeah, that setback if, is a complicated If Mr. Shape. Harper, I mean, if Mr. Taylor were here, he'd say, well, there's no site plans. This is a very, you're asking for three different variances. We don't know what this looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, you guys I, didn't receive the site plan in our packet? Uh, we, have lots, of, we have plenty of site plans. Oh, do we have any? Oh, yes. They, oh, yeah, they did a good job with that. Thanks. Or oh, just elevations, I guess, is what. Okay. So the question is, you have three. You're asking for three different setbacks here. So yeah, let me just uh, clarify one quick thing. So, yeah, the, the BZA document 1.0, yes. that shows the existing building envelope as Very narrow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 1.1 is what we're asking for, but that building footprint, or building envelope, excuse me, that's the building envelope only. Just like on the neighboring property, if you have a uh, 150 foot long and a 50 foot wide property, that gives you a 110 foot long and a 40 foot wide building envelope. It doesn't mean you're going to build a 110 foot long by a 40 foot wide house. In the same case with us. So BZA 1.1 is just showing the maximum buildable envelope. But then 1.2 shows the actual proposed footprint and what we're planning on doing there. And so you can see that the carport is off the alleyway, giving plenty of access for the vehicles, and the total yeah. building coverage is 1,550 square feet. John Michael, can you answer whether the required versus what they're asking for setbacks here? At least three setbacks. What's required versus what? I think the document that the appellant identified previously as BZA 1.1. This is the large foldout in your packet. Well, that, the mirror one. Yes. Bottom left hand corner. Right, unless it's changed since then, shows the front. The requested front setback is five. The requested rear setback is five. The requested left side, or I guess that's the uh, twenty closer to Long Avenue side, is three. And then along the alley, ten. Ten is what's required along that alley. So that's not a setback. Uh, variants that they would need there. The other three do represent setback variances, 20 but and 20 front and rear, and then five on that interior side closer to Long yep. Avenue, if that answers the question. Put these two together. Mm -hmm. 20 is required, yep. is required. But 20 is what the code requires. Okay, I was just verifying that with you. So going from 20 to basically 15 on each side, and uh, yeah. Okay, front and rear, yeah. 
front and rear, and then five. Well, no, that's the same. Okay. So a difference of 15, that's a big difference. So, okay. If, <coughs> excuse me, if the, if this property had not been uh, shifted 90 degrees to have a front on South Street, if it, the front had continued to face the direction it originally faced onto Long Street, then the five foot side setback would be their current five foot front setback that we're requesting. And the same with the rear. Those would, main, those would be the same, as well as that 10 foot setback off the alley. So the, I, I understand that you we're asking for 15 feet either way, which sounds like a big ask, but so, in you context, know, it's the same as the rest of the neighborhood. Variances are always based on hardship, and you know this is a pretty square lot. So what is your hardship of why you need to build so much in these setbacks because this is a square lot? So let me refer back to the BZA 1.0. That kind of identifies the hardship. The, the shaded gray area. The shaded gray area represents the allowable building envelope as the current setbacks would state per zoning. And that gives us a 530 square foot building envelope that's 10 foot wide by 53 feet long. That would not quite hold a single wide trailer. So is something in between those two that is reasonable and much, because your neighbors are saying it's too much in the setback. And that's, that's exactly why we came up with the building footprint that we did, which is that l shape averaging of the two. Instead of actually taking up the huge amount of space within the setback that we're requesting, we, we're taking up less than half of the total lot size. So this is 15 size. feet on either side, taking up a lot of space on the setback? Um, I, I guess it, certainly yes, to answer your question, yes. but. Uh, the the problem that we're having is that the not the entire house we're not asking to fill the entire setback area with well, house. Well, you can't do that. That's not the code doesn't allow that, and it's all my years on this board we've never allowed that. Sure. So that's just not even reasonable. Sure. It's like oh we're not asking for build on the entire part of the lot. Well, no one says you can't. So the question is, but you're building on a very large portion of this lot. And that's why the council person was concerned. I so. want I want to speak to that too. I noticed council member Withers talked about if this much building took place on that size lot that we really could not honor the tree canopy requirements that we have. I think he called it the Metro Tree Code is what I wrote down, that he said we could never honor that if that much building is on that lot. I'm not sure what he meant there, but um, he was concerned about that, and of course we've heard the trees were removed, but he ha obviously had a concern about that. I, I believe he was referring to the, the same instance of the entire setback area, their entire building envelope area. The building footprint that we have proposed is less than half of the size of the lot. So there'd be plenty of area to revegetate and plant new trees. The footprint is less than half the size of the lot? Correct. I'm looking at a drawing which looks like it takes up a good portion of the Th lot. That is, those are the proposed setbacks. The proposed building footprint is on the next page. Mm -hmm. yeah. BZA 1.2 is what this one's called. The total square footage of the house will be how many square feet? The living space will be, I think it's just under 3,000 square feet. But, but the footprint is right around 15? Just over 1,500, 1,550-ish. 1550 yeah, 1,567. So you're proposing this carport and then living space above the carport, which is? Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
That was part of the effort to make it so that the house didn't appear to be as massive, create a, an a, outdoor carport that, that, with clean sight lines all the way through instead of having a boxed in garage. So you've essentially left the corner open. Correct. And if, if there's no fence, there would be no obstruction. I would I would say that you would be able to see your your path on South 20th Street as you're pulling up the alley before you even get to our property. So what what are the tree requirements on, on this property? Have you guys talked about it's, that at all? I believe it's per linear foot. There, uh, three. Up 20th. Uh, yeah, tw every 20 feet. There's a, I think a five gallon or or a small caliper tree required for planting. And and generally on a 50 foot wide lot that requires uh, two trees to be planted. On this lot it happens to be 68 feet long, so we're looking at planting four small caliper trees. But you, you feel comfortable you have room to do that? Plenty. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Harper, in an exceedingly rare moment, zoning staff can address your urban forester question here from 17.24.100, <laughs> replacement of trees, subsection two. Regarding residential properties, subsection B, sub subsection Roman numeral one, one two inch caliper tree for each 30 feet of lot frontage. And that's what applies to single and two family lots other than those zoned agricultural, and that seems to be what's applicable here. So as noted by the appellant, they are likely to be in a very good position to be able to do exactly that. Excluding alley frontage. Well, I understand that you are gonna have to come in to your carport off the alley and you're not gonna have a drive off 20th, but is, is there even a sidewalk off 20th to, to your property? Would there be to a proposed house? Yes, ma'am, there's a, a walkway drawn there off 20th Street. Um, it would just be you know, simple oh, concrete. Thank you, my path. architect friend has just shown me where the sidewalk would be on the drawing. And the primary reason for for having just the walkway out to the street there instead of having the driveway off off the main street is that this access that we have drawn in off the alleyway is definitely the most accommodating for the topography. Don't need to make any huge cuts into the hillside or create an off street parking pad. Any other questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? I don't believe so. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to address any any confusion. Okay. Seeing none, we are going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I, I think uh, once I kind of dug into the drawings, I, I think they've done about as good a job as you can do on, on a site this small. We, we see cases like this, uh, and I'm actually remembering now after looking at the file, this case, although we don't really have any details on what the setbacks requested or the variances given were. But given, you know, that the street is, South 20th is, you know, already almost 17 feet away from the property line, you know, I, I feel like it's a fairly modest footprint and I, I don't know that they could have done much better to, to address the concerns. That's sort of my take on it. Well, we did have council member Withers saying he is not supporting it, and he must have some reason. What What do you all perceive as his reason for not supporting it? Well, I mean, I wrote down most of what he said. You know, there were numerous things, including the alley, you know, potential fence. The applicant, applicant addressed that. Um, you know, just the size, the setbacks. You know, I agree with David that basically this is a tiny lot that the applicant really paid market value for. And um, if you were gonna build something on it that's least, um, tramp that doesn't trample as much as it could on the neighboring properties given the location and the size and the corporate thing, this is probably about as best you're gonna get. Um, that's where I am on this. Well, I agree with both of the Davids and would add that um, the proposed residence, the front, um, the front of it and the back of it do line up with the house to the north, the sides of the house to the north. So they're not trying to come forward or backwards. They're not um, trying to expand more than what that house is. 
Yeah, and as far as hardship, uh, I don't know if you guys have looked closely at the the survey, the to topographic survey. Uh, it's it's eight and a half by eleven. It's V two point two, and it's it's a uh, not only is it a small site relative to the other ones, it, it's a uh, it's got significant topography issues, and I think that alone, uh, well, that and given the small size of the lot, I think are both uh, acceptable hardships as far as the variance goes. Does someone want to make a motion? Well, I'll make a motion to um, approve the setback, requ the setback requests uh, based on the fact that the lot is small. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mm. Passes four to one. Good luck. Did you want to say anything about the fence in there? Well, I think w <laughs> they said no. You should probably just go now. Yeah. <laughs> Since I forgot that. Case passed four to one. The approval is granted. This brings us to case number 2017-156. This case involves a property at 2317 Pennington Bend Road out in Council District Number 15, where Council Member Jeff Syracuse has participated in these conversations and is present with us today to make his presentation at the outside of the case or at the end of the case, whichever he prefers, of course. The zoning map shown here shows you the Cumberland River to the far left, the highlighted properties here, um, or one of the highlighted properties here showing the general area proposed for development in the R15 zoning district. The aerial gives you a good feel for the proximity to the river and the development surrounding. The site plan submitted gives a sense of the setback reduction that is requested. This is, of course, a request for a variance from the front setback requirements to construct single family um, developments on each of the three identified lots. From my recent site visit showing the lot from Pennington Bend Road, to the interior of the lot showing some of the grade heading back toward the river and across the river to the view at Brush Hill Road. The view up and down Pennington Bend on the left, upper and lower there, and then to the far right, the view directly across the street from the subject lot. Uh, the appellant is Adam Epstein. He's represented by Mr. Joey Hargis and Baker Donaldson in this case. There are opponents for the case present, so both sides will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Mr. Hargis, of course, and the appellants will want to reserve whatever time out of this 15 minutes for their rebuttal. Uh, Councilman Syracuse, Cal uh, Vice Mayor David Bradley, both present with an interest in this case. Do either way you wish to address the board at this point? Very briefly. Yeah, Vice Mayor Briley. Welcome to the BZA. Thanks for being here. For Please me. press the button. So. Thanks for having me and thanks for your service to the city. It's almost as thankless as <laughs> being Vice Mayor. <laughs> Shepherding 40 council people. 39. 39. 39. Right, Miss Sanford. 39. Um, I, I'm here to basically, um, I, I've spoken to Mr. Herbert and to um, the Stormwater Division, Tom Palco there, just about uh, encouraging uh, y'all and codes to coordinate as we look at these lots on Pennington Bend. I used to live directly across the river on the bluff, looking out at these lots and saw them all flood. Um, during the 2010 flood, and not just flood a little, um, you know, there were boats floating to pull people out of houses right there on the bend. That's why we have um, very strict um, buffers there. Um, and I think in those buffers were taken, in, part of the factors in, in adopting those buffers was uh, looking at street setbacks as well. So um, before this body were to allow a, a um, variance from any of the setbacks, which would then be the premise for an applicant to go to um, the stormwater division and get a second variance, 
Um, what I would ask you to consider is the fact that the city just spent millions of dollars paying for and tearing down houses on this same road in order to prevent um, the kind of damage and emergency response that we're responsible for as a community. This is not a road that has multiple ingress and egress. And in fact, um, the only manner of rescue from these lots um, during the flood was by boat. There was no street access to these lots. So just, I would, I would just ask that you take all of that into consideration before you look at these lots. I'm sure the lawyer, um, the lawyers will lawyer up and remind you that the condition of these lots is no different than the conditions of all the other lots on the street. So there's no need, there's not really, in my opinion, a legal basis for a setback variance there, so. So Vice Mayor Briley, we, um, the city, purchased, as you said, a lot of houses, really. So clarify to us that basically, if I had a house in this area and they deemed it to be in a flood zone that is probably going to flood again, same thing for Bordeaux where I grew up, they bought houses. But my understanding is if you had an empty lot and your neighbor had a house on that lot, the city would buy the house but they would not buy your lot, even if there was another house on the other side, and they bought both of those, but they didn't buy empty land. Is that no, correct? I would say that's probably a fair, fair statement. So our yeah. buyback program didn't include land just because there were no structures there. Had there been a structure on some of these lots, they, the they city would have bought them. Perhaps. That's perhaps Maybe. true. But I think they're appraised at the value, sort of assuming that you can't build there. Okay. And um, if, in the event, the either the denial of a permit here or at the stormwater division resulted in some sort of constitutional um, requirement for compensation, I'm sure the city would consider that. But that doesn't change the city's obligation to protect the future owners of homes in this, in this area from the risk of being cut off in a flood from fire protection, police protection, or in fact from the ability to survive a flood in the future. So um, that's a, I would just take that, I hope you will consider that seriously as you, as you consider this, I think, at a future meeting. And while I'm up here, I, I did want to say about something about number 164, which is also, it's on page five. Mm -hmm. um, and it is on Brush Hill Road across the river from Pennington Bend, where I used to live. <laughs> and um, it's, the fam it's the Hall family's residence. It's a great, what I would call, stone tutor, small. They've done a great job um, renovating it over the last few years, keeping it in, in character of the neighborhood. They're here asking for a, a height variance on, on a detached garage. Um, considering the, the lay of the land and the character of that lot, which is quite big, um, I would be very supportive of the request for a variance on that. Okay. So those are the Any two questions things. for uh, Mr. Briley? Thank you for being here. Mr. Hargis, let's get going. Well, Mr. Ewing, as the, and thanks Vice Mayor for his comments, uh, as he alluded to, I, I am respectfully requesting a deferral um, for this case for two meetings. Uh, the purpose of which is to uh, is to to take a look at the site plan to see if there are potentially a lesser variance which would, mm -hmm. could be asked for, or even full compliance with the street setback. Uh, but the builder would like to take a second look at it. And I think importantly too, and I've mentioned to the council member and uh, some of the oppositions represented by Mr. K uh, Mr. Dane and his council that uh, there's no harm in talking. Uh, the, the neighborhood association held a meeting last night. Our clients were, you know, myself or a client was not invited. Uh, I know the Neighborhood Association President, Mr. Lawler's here. I'd publicly invite invite us yeah. to the next meeting. We'd love to come talk well, to you. What we would do more normally is we invite the council person to have the official meeting, and the sure. council person invites voters and people, interested parties, and he could be the one that kind of quarterbacks sure. it. And, and I'm happy to, to, to meet, and as, as Ms. Uh, uh, Karpinek talked about, too, you know, that uh, if an applicant wants to defer, this board should, should grant it, and that's always been this board's policy, both in my tenure you're here and uh, now outside council, and I, I don't see any harm. We respectfully request a two-meeting deferral, okay. I, and I think from a from a standpoint of, and, and 
obviously I encourage Mr. Dean has, has maybe has an opposing view. Okay. Uh, but I would say this, that, that for purposes of, uh, and, and I think Mr. Dean agrees, that, that we think as far as a vote on deferral or any action that Mr. King, I respect your, uh, I would ask that you recuse yourself from this case since you own property within the area. Uh, and Mr. Dean, I think. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Is this for, for three houses on the property or nine? I've heard there of are them. three total, yes, sir. There's three individual lots, one house upon each. And why would you ask for my deferral? You own property within the area. So if our clients were successful in obtaining a variance and build, there is, in my belief, an, a, an indirect cause that your property may become more valuable as well. So I think you, you may have a, an now, interest in it. And I think now it's, it's up to Mr. King sure, whether he, no, could, he should, and he doesn't have to determine he that today. No. But, you know, duly noted. Thank but you. normally we, um, rec people recuse themselves because it's a family member, someone Absolutely. they work with, or they have a direct financial interest in whatever is being built. Sure. So but we will let him determine absolutely. that. Absolutely. I appreciate your call. Appreciate hearing from you. Thank okay. you. We're going to hear from Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean, what do you have to say about this deferral? Uh, okay, got the got the speaker working. That's always a good thing. Um, my clients have been here all afternoon. Mm -hmm. I know you have too. They'd like to go ahead and get it over with. Um, uh, the comments here. Vice Mayor Briley was here as well. Um, I can understand you've had a long day. You got mm -hmm. several more, so leave it to the board. But but we're here and ready to proceed. Okay. Uh, by the way, I don't represent all the neighbors. There may be uh, some of the other neighbors you'd like to have a say about it, but I, I represent uh, several of the neighbors. Okay. And for the purposes of record, I, I reached out to Mr. Dean yeah. 2.30 or so this yeah, afternoon sure. during the sure. first break, but I understand. Board that. members, questions for these two lawyers? Uh, no, I, do we want to hear from the, or could we hear from the councilman? Before Staff would encourage that, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Councilman Syracuse. And then we'll Welcome the to the BZA. Room. Thanks for being here. And uh, you heard these two lawyers. What are you saying about all of this? Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. I, I certainly always encourage neighbors to, to have communication. Uh, I, I, but I will make my opinion known that I think that this variance request should be denied. Um, as you see in, in, in the pic picture here, uh, the amount of development in the floodway buffer is extraordinary. Um, we all lived through the flood in, in 2010, and uh, Vice Mayor Briley was very eloquent in, in uh, his description of that. Um, my concern is that if we start uh, allowing for variances in developable properties along Pennington Bend Road, we are then building back to the level that we were at when the flood hit of 2010. Um, which we don't want to happen. And uh, the one, I'm not an attorney, but from the legal perspective that, that, I, that I have researched, the section 17.40.370 that governs the, the BZA, subsection F, no harm to public welfare. Um, if you uh, can determine that this variance does not ultimately lead to a, uh, a condition of uh, harming the public welfare, I think that's something you have to seriously consider, especially if you allow a variance here that then would uh, set a precedent for the next person to come along. And if you do uh, allow this variance, does the next person that uh, would be allowed to then develop this much into the floodway buffer, um, where are we headed with this? So what I would ask you is to be very cautious. This is not just a setback uh, a re request a variance. This allows to be build in the floodway buffer. Um, to this day, obviously, I still deal with uh, f flood, flooding issues, erosion issues. Um, this, uh, even though the flood happened um, seven years ago, uh, this district is still uh, dealing with issues from the 2010 flood. So I please ask that you are very cautious, and ultimately, I am uh, against the, any sort of variance uh, of, of this nature. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I, I, I am, or I do plan to move that we uh, defer the case, but I, I would request that uh, the, the attorneys for the, well, I was going to say for both sides, 
but as far as Mr. Dean represents, I, I would like to, to uh, hear your views uh, when you come back on that uh, section F that the councilman was referring to and uh, the public good and, and what that means, uh, what you guys think that means for us and what we must consider or should and can consider. Sir, no problem. And if it's okay, Chairman, I, I will move that we defer this. Uh, do, do we have a date? I'm sorry. The, August 3rd. Uh, I, I move that we defer to the August 3rd meeting. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of deferring it to August 2nd, signify by saying aye. Oh, August 3rd, so I think aye. 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 Opposed? It is deferred till the third. We will see you back here. It's the third, right? The yes. third, yes. Thank you. The next case before the board is number 2017-157, involving the property at 949 and 951 Southside Place in Council District number 17. Please quietly. We would respectfully ask the members of the audience to depart quietly if you choose to depart so the board can continue with its exceedingly long agenda. Thank you for your consideration. Again, we would ask politely if you would be quiet as you exit so the board can continue. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Chairman, the, site or rather the uh, zoning map shown here demonstrates the subject property on Southside Place and R6 zoning district, allowing one or two family development. The request before the board is a variance from the height restrictions in that R6 district in order to keep the construction as currently completed at the subject residences. The aerial view shows you the developed residential area just to the west of the 8 South Corridor. The site plan previously submitted on this case, a case that was once heard as an item A matter, a challenge from a neighboring property owner with regard to the height in question, uh, was an item A case that was withdrawn. However, the construction is the same that was previously at issue. Although a bit dated now, my, the um, photographs show in the lower left-hand corner here the subject residences at 949 and 951. My site visits are now dated because much of this is finished out and in fact the appellant will probably be able to speak to full completion of the construction at this location. With that, Mr. Harold Johnson is the appellant and Progressive, LL, Progressive Development LLC, the owner of that property. Mr. Johnson is representative from the owner as well. Um, is there opposition present today for this case? I believe Mr. Dean is still here and some other neighbors as well. Therefore, Mr. Johnson will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation, saving whatever time he wishes for rebuttal out of that 15 minutes, and then we would hear from the opponents thereafter. Again, the variance is for a height, the request is for a height variance for the structure already completed at the subject address. Uh, Mr. Johnson, if you would introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Uh, my name is Harold Johnson, 914 Villa Place. Um, oh, I need to get these packets to you that I've presented. applying for my variance uh, for the height restriction. Um, I've created packets for you guys. First thing that I'd like to point out is the uh, item number one in my packet. That's the picture of the house from the left, the right, and the center view. Uh, from the street view, there are, you cannot see the bulkhead. Uh, I've kind of have it centered and towards the back half of the property. Um, prior to this, uh, the construction of this home, I'd seen several other homes in the neighborhood that had uh, a similar bulkhead, and so I, I, I thought that, that it, it was a, a legal structure and that I could put up the bulkhead so I could have access to my rooftop deck in case of any roof leaks or anything. And uh, so we, we put this up just for, for access where we could get to the roof. I have reviewed the code, and uh, if you'll refer to uh, Item number three, um, it states that we're supposed to measure this from the rooftop deck to the, uh, to the um, ground elevation prior to grading the lot off, prior to rough grade or anything like that. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking that we're, we're supposed to be measuring this from, from natural grade to the rooftop. Um, and uh, that was another thing that led me to believe that, that this was legal. Um, on, 
item number two, these are these are several homes that, that are in the neighborhood uh, and I've taken pictures. Uh, the very first picture is a whole block on Archer Street that has the same bulkhead. However, these are, are most of them are not fully attached, they're detached. Um, they're roughly around 18 foot wide and they go up about 53 foot in there. I did personally go out there when, when all this was happening and they filed their item A took a laser and, and measured one of them at being 53 foot high in there. The base zoning for that is RM20 and to, to my knowledge I don't think that there's any uh, any uh, thing that differentiates the, the height restrictions between that and R6 but uh, unless Metro Council can po point out otherwise. Um, the second picture is 1013 12th Avenue South which also has the, uh, the, the same bulkhead on there. Um, if we go right behind me at Southside Avenue, 1009 South Ave Southside Avenue, th this is a, pretty much the same structure that I've constructed with the same bulkheads. Um, if we go to the, uh, again, the 1100th block of, of Archer, we, we show the units being detached and uh, going up that high with the bulkhead. Uh, the next picture is another shot of uh, two more on 12th Avenue South with the bulkhead. Uh, if you go one more page over, you can see the, the home right next to 1009 Southside Avenue, which is located at 1011 Southside Avenue with the same bulkhead. Uh, you flip over one more picture and you go to 1007 South Street. This one is a three level again and in the very uh, back right hand corner you can see another bulkhead on this right here. Uh, I took this just just to, to take the picture. This is pretty much level with my home and they haven't even taken the opportunity to do a bulkhead. They just went uh, a full four levels with it. You can count them where the garage is, first, second, third and fourth, fourth levels. Uh, this one's right at the corner of Southside Place, the next, pic the next picture. Um, and and that you, when you get there, that, that's the same, pretty much the same height if, if you're looking at it. I didn't take the liberty uh, uh, of, that these guys did and, and hire a surveyor, and I'm not trying to hate on these guys or, or, or throw a monkey wrench in their plan. Uh, I'm just stating the simple fact that, that everybody in the neighborhood has, has done this, the, the, the same thing. I'm thinking that I'm legal. These guys flat filed like a Class A appeal on me. Uh, I, I come to the Class A appeal. And I, I think I'm good. Uh, I, I, I'm sitting here. I'm reading code. Uh, I, I talked to Mr. Herbert, and then we're approached by George Dean, and George Dean goes to some subsection that I've never even heard of, saying, "Oh, well, if you go subsection this and subsection that, and then go back to this right here, it says that no obstructions." Shall be shall be placed in that. Uh, I think that these these codes contradict each other. Uh, Bill Herbert made the, the 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 same statement in our first BCA hearing on the Class A item appeal, saying that that the codes conflicted. I, I agree with Bill. I, I think that these codes do conflict. Uh, George Dean, everybody has their, their, their opinions on this, and George Dean seems to think that they complement each other. I'm in disagreement. I, I think that they that they kind of contradict each other. Uh, the whole story we was provided at the last BZA hearing what was uh, uh, Sonny West has always uh, granted the, these bulkheads. He felt that we needed access to our roof. Uh, in case of any water leaks or anything. So uh, it has always been overlooked by, by the codes department. The, the bulkheads have, have been completely overlooked. That there, there are several out there that have, have the bulkheads on there. There are several that are under construction right now that have the bulkheads uh, on there. Uh, and I, I'm just requesting a variance, asking that I, I be granted the same courtesy that everybody else in the neighborhood and that codes uh, kind of gives me the same opportunity that, that I, everybody else has, has had in, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, In simple words, simple statement, what is your hardship? 
Uh, that's another thing. There is no sh hardship needed to file for a variance on this. Uh, I had met with uh, John Michael and Bill Herbert prior to filing my variance, and uh, I think subsection 17.16.150 states that if this falls in a UCO, no hardship is needed to file for a variance on this matter. And Let's I, ask Mr. Herbert about that. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know where to begin. Um, I've, um, I've heard um, things that, that Mr. Johnson said that I said that I didn't say. Um, and I think that it was very clear that when you filed for this, I said you're going to have to prove the hardship if you're going to ask for a variance. I've, I've never said that you are not going to have to prove this. I don't know how you're going to prove it. But I've never said that you don't have to have a hardship. And, I'm, and I would say that um, I thought I made it pretty clear when we came back on the second meeting that after looking at the very first meeting, there was a lot of confusion because I had not looked at this. Having gone and looked at it, the, um, the uh, application that was reviewed by our department made it could not have made it any more clear on the site plan that it was limited to 45 feet. Um, in fact, the stairwell bulkhead, a line was drawn through it uh, on the site plan saying that you can't do this, you can't build it, and Richard Thermopolis, the zoning examiner, specifically marked on the site plan said you can't build it this way. He built it anyway. Um, in doing, in going back and talking to the zoning examiners, it was my understanding, um, going back years, that that um, the prior zoning administra administrator had allowed this. I was in error on that. After talking to my most experienced zoning examiners, they told me that there had been a case many, many years ago where somebody had wanted to have the stairwell bulkhead and that the BZA had granted that. Um, going forward, all of the zoning examiners had um, not taken that to be the rule, but rather had gone ahead and continued to apply the zoning code across the board with regard to height, and that folks could periodically come to the Board of Zoning Appeals if they so chose to still to, to seek um, a variance from those provisions if they chose. But it's, I was informed by, by most experienced examiners that our department has upheld the provisions of the zoning code um, uniformly since that time. Um, so what else? Oh, and I cannot address, um, Mr. Johnson has said there were a number of other structures up and down the, you know, the street that are done the same way. I can't address those specifically. However, he's referenced one um, that was brought to my attention earlier this week. Um, I had the building inspector go out and look. Um, a asphalt surveys were submitted and that structure is compliant. The, the issue is, with respect to height, is where do you measure from? So if you've got an exposed basement, then the code says that it provided that basement is no more than seven feet tall that's from exposed and you can measure from the ceiling of that basement um, up and then from there, you're limited to 45 feet. So at the end of the day, you could have a structure that is taller than 45 feet. It's 45 feet from wherever you begin to measure. If you don't have an exposed basement, then you measure from the average of the four corners of the structure up 45 feet. So to say that they're out there and they're taller than 45 feet, yeah, you're probably right. They probably are, but it doesn't make them illegal. It makes them code compliant. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Herbert? Okay. Continue. I don't know if we could look up 17.16.150, if Metro Legal could look that up, but it, I, I was read this in Bill Herbert's office with John Michael, and I personally read this, and it said that I did not need a hardship. And I think that's when we were under the assumption that you were within the UZO. And I am under the UZO, sir. Yeah, and then that... I, 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 th this applies to me. I never would have applied for this variance if y'all if y'all didn't point this out and read it to me point blank. I, I wouldn't be here wasting anybody's this time if I, couldn't, the if I couldn't apply for this. Of note, Mr. Chairman, the case before the board
award as filed by the appellant is for a variance pursuant to 17.40.180B, not for a special exception. It is an accurate statement to say that special exceptions do not require the demonstration of the hardship as a point of law. Variances, by necessary definition under 17.40, do. So, Mr. Johnson is, is partially correct in that in our meeting, we had assumed that there was a way to go forward um, with the height as a special exception. Something was brought to our attention later where it was determined that it could only go forward as a variance, and uh, we contacted you and let you know that. No, sir. I, I well, that's why your application is for a variance and not a special exception. I'm sorry, Bill. You didn't, you didn't contact me and let me know that. Mr. Johnson filed the appeal. Mr. Johnson's appeal specifically states it's for a variance. It cites the code section for a variance. There is no language except for a variance. The notices that Mr. Johnson submitted were for a variance. The sign on the property says it's for a variance. The only request before the board is therefore for a variance, not a special exception. Variances require the demonstration of hardship personal to 17.40. So continue. All right. Um, have you talked to any of your neighbors or? No, people? sir, I have not. So any other people support this besides you? Uh, no, sir. So the real reason you say you want this is so you could just have access to your roof for safety reasons? Yes, sir. And what would those safety reasons be? Uh, for water leaks. If the roof was to ever leak so I could have access, right now you'd have to have a boom truck to get up there to, to replace any roofing. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? So. We're going to hear from the opposition, and you have, you'll have eight minutes and 18 seconds for rebuttal to come back after they speak. So sure. those in opposition, this is your time to speak. Please come forward. Oh, and while they're here, please sit back in the audience. Is Mr. Dean, are you going to come up here too? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, let's get us started. Everyone identify themselves and for the record, their address. My name is George Dean. I'm here on behalf of the folks who own the property adjacent to this, uh, kind of towards the rear, away from downtown. Mm -hmm. The specific address is 949 Southside Place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's actually a corporate entity, RMN Development. Um, uh, Mr. Lair and Mr. Loveless are principals in the uh, uh, group, as I understand. I, I, I'll really just be very brief, given uh, what was presented. There's no hardship here. Um, you've got to show some hardship attached to the ground. There, there is none. Um, we were here earlier because my clients were very concerned about the view that they have, they, they built their building in compliance. They assumed that this property in front of them would be built in compliance as well. There's a, there's a uh, small rise. They would have a, a view of downtown. And I don't know, John, John may have just stepped out. <laughs> I've got a couple of photos, <laughs> maybe when he comes back in. Uh, but the, um, uh, that's why they um, uh, were concerned about this, concerned enough to have a uh, as-built survey done on Mr. Johnson's property. Uh, the, the, maybe the main thing that I want to reemphasize is from what uh, Mr. Herbert said. Um, the, when the submission was made originally, uh, it was clearly indicated that the maximum height was 45 feet. 
And I've got the, uh, I wanted to, I don't have copies for everybody, just to, just to put in the record though, uh, that's a copy of our as-built survey. The, um, and, and what does your survey show? Oh, well, and we've, this, this was here before on 2017, uh, the, the docket number is 2017-116, and basically shows that they're up around uh, 52 feet uh, in terms of the height. So uh, about seven feet out right. of compliance. Uh, the, um, uh, th there's also a letter in the file from another neighbor who's also opposed um, a, a Mr. Uh, uh, Tim Bradley, uh, and I, I, just to make sure you've got it in your record, I'll, I'll add it there. This is a copy of the, uh, the markup of the site plan that was submitted by Mr. Johnson originally, and you, you can see it's circled, uh, max height 45 feet, written by Richard Thermopolis. Uh, so it, it's hard to understand how he didn't understand the, the height maximum that was uh, uh, attached to this property at the time that the construction took place. Uh, uh, this is a variance. I can make it even simpler than what um, uh, John and Bill were talking about. Um, uh, UZO, non-UZO, doesn't make any difference. I, as, as the board may know, I, I appear in front of all kinds of zoning boards across Middle Tennessee. Frequently, I don't bother with the local zoning ordinance. I know metros pretty well, but frequently I don't bother with the local zoning ordinance because Tennessee State Code 13-7-207 uh, uh, says you gotta have a variance. I, I don't care what's in the local code. <laughs> in order to have a variance, you've got to show a, a hardship and you have to show some exceptional physical feature of the property. Uh, there, isn't, there just isn't one here. And as a result, we'd uh, ask that the variance not be granted. By the way, we have uh, a, a purchaser of our property uh, who's here today, actually, and they're very interested that this variance not be granted uh, uh, to the extent that uh, they're, they're concerned about uh, having this property higher than so that they can't see into the downtown area from what would hopefully become their new home. And that's all I have. Okay. Questions for Mr. Dean? Do you all have anything else to add? Please identify yourself for the record. Okay, yes, my name's Nancy Viano, and I reside at 936 Archer Street. Mm -hmm. And as a neighbor, I wanted to um, express my concern because the reason that people have built in this in this area is very, uh, it's, it's specifically lovely because of its view of downtown Nashville. And for people to build um, and go beyond the height restriction negates that for neighbors. And uh, aside from being um, rude and, and uh, I guess, a, a bad aesthetic. It's it's just um, it's it's bad architecture. It's bad. Um, it's it's really bad business for the neighborhood for things to be built in such a way. And we don't want to see that precedent set for other. There's a lot of construction happening there, and just to be mindful and respectful of other people and their views. Okay. My name is Gigi Gaskins. I'm also on Archer Street 921, and I also own 928 Archer, and neither parcels have been built yet. But it's just like we've been sitting here listening to hours of setback. Height restriction, it's a legal height restriction that has to be honored just like a setback. And I feel the man's pain if he did not understand that and he built uh, unknowingly, but there's been proof here right now that he did know, and that really constitutes really an illegal act, I would think, if he knew it was 45 feet, and um, he intentionally violated that. Um, I mean, I don't understand the claim about the roof access because if you know you're going to build a 45 feet structure, you just have to deal with however you're going to get up there to deal with the roof. And um, yes, I mean, that whole pocket of neighborhood all has to live within those parameters. Those are um, what they're there for. And if not, what would stop me from doing the same thing. Like I haven't built my houses yet, so I can go build 52 feet, 55 feet in the air and then come right back in here and say, well, you know, um, you know, <laughs> so. 
Thanks for being here. Any questions for the opposition? Okay. Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. So rebuttal time. First, I'd like to clarify that, uh, yes, Richard Thermopolis did mark 45 foot on there. However, I have a, another person that goes and pulls the permits. I testified to this at the last BZA mer uh, meeting and made you guys aware, hey, we, we made a mistake on the bulkhead and we went over uh, and as to the other girl's testimony, uh, I did not know that we were exceeding height limitations at the time. Uh, we built this thing and it was called to my attention after we had everything framed out that we were over on our height. Uh, if it was called to your attention when everything was framed out, why didn't you change it then? Because I thought it was legal. I, at that time, I went directly to the code and read read what it said uh, about how I was how I was to measure my structure. But you didn't look at the I, document I, that I, Richard or anybody I didn't. Else? I, I didn't. I wasn't provided with that document until our very first BZA meeting. Stucco, everything had been applied to it. Everything was built. Okay. So getting back to what Mr. Dean said and what we were saying earlier, what's the hardship? I believe the hardship would be the, the I, I feel that the, the codes contradict each other. I, I, I read that, that one code and it said how I was to measure my building. They referred to another structure. Our hardships in, uh, for the BZA have to be, and Mr. Dean alluded to this, something that deals with the physical attributes of the land. Okay. Like, you know, we had a case earlier, the lot was small, sometimes there could be topography issues, but there was no physical attributes of the land that you have mentioned. Okay. No? I, w I would say that I would say the topography of it, the the lands like this, that the lands... That didn't keep slopes. you from building at 45 feet. Okay. I'm trying to think outside the box. I, I don't guess I have any hardships then. Okay. If y'all questions of the applicant. Okay. Anything else to add? Um. Yeah. I I I, I do want to. I, I would like to add something. Okay. Um, at our last BCA meeting, I, I, I was recommended by Bill Harbert and by the BCA board to, get, to try to get resolution on this uh, with, with Ron Layer and RWN Construction. Uh, I would like to tell you I've made the, my, my best attempts to, to, to clear this up with them. Yeah, I met Mr. Ron Layer out at his house. Uh, and what was told that they would drop this whole thing if I could help him out on his rooftop deck. You'll uh, go to number five uh, on your on your packet that I that I've, I've given you guys. This this is his estimate. Uh, when we came back for the first BZA meeting, yeah, I made him a ten thousand dollar offer. To, okay, so to, what does that have to do with our for case here, particularly that we're trying to for you to prove a hardship? I mean, your communication to other the, parties. The, this is my documents that that, that I've, I've I've provided to you guys. This is what that's I not going to help us with our decision okay. to whether. Well, you, then I don't guess I have anything else to, to, okay. to offer on this. Thank you. Um, we'll close the public hearing then. Okay. Discussion. I don't see the hardship. Uh, I'll move that we uh, deny the request for the variance based on lack of hardship. Okay, motion's been made and probably seconded. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes five to nothing. Mr. Chairman, the next case to come before the board is 2017-159. Jerry Broncus is the appellant and owner of the property located at 1246 Kenmore Place in East Nashville. Council uh, District number seven. Yes, sir. Three minutes. Yes, we'll take a brief break so the board can get a little comfort and be back in about five minutes.
Okay, John Michael, let's get everyone back. Well, good enough. Members of the board will reconvene and take up case number 2017-159. Mr. Jerry Brockus is the appellate owner. Please feel free to come forward, Mr. Brockus. The property in question is at 1246 Kenmore Place. The request is for a variance from the height requirements in the RS 7.5 district in order to keep a previously constructed detached garage. The request is to go up from the 16 feet required max for that garage up to 18, an increase of two with this variance. The zoning map here shows the subject property on Kenmore, not too far off McGavick Pike. The aerial view shows you the subject property. The site plan gives a, a simplistic representation of where that detached garage is located on the property. And then the photographs from my recent sunny day site visit to the subject property, the view up and down Kenmore here on the left and across the street in the lower right. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 159? Seeing none, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Mr. Brox, if you'd introduce yourself by name and address and address the board. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, kind of like Miss Chapel, I'm not well schooled, and <laughs> after hearing all these esteemed people come up here and lay out their cases, I, my mind's kind of jumping. Oh, up. you could do it. Just <laughs> give us your name and your address, and we'll I'm, get going. I'm sorry, Jerry Brock, 1246 Kenmore Place. So, what are you asking for today, Jerry? Um, I built a building. Well, about nine years ago, my wife and I had a little dream about a, a garage and workshop and uh, it took us a long time to put the money together to, to, to build this thing. And when we finally, finally built it, uh, I was my, this is my first rodeo with codes. Uh, so I was relying upon you know, other people's uh, experiences and also the inspectors that came out and inspected you know, the, the building as it came went up on you know, how I should you know, proceed and, and uh, but anyway, uh, it ended up that uh, I got my building higher than my height allowance was because I, I thought when they told me 16 feet, that was from the roof line, and then from the roof line to the peak, that was the the uh, gable end, and I didn't realize the gable end is is considered a wall also. But anyway. Whenever so how much higher did you build it? Two feet. Two feet. <laughs> okay. So and so you're, today you're asking us to keep it. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so you made the mistake. Um, have you talked to any of your neighbors or is anybody? Yeah, no one's here there, objecting, but do there, what, there, what your uh, neighbors say? A couple of them stopped by. I was hoping they wrote, wrote the letter because I told them I'd, you mm -hmm. know if they couldn't come that they could at least write a letter. But right. uh, uh, apparently they didn't. Well, at least they didn't write any letters <laughs> against it. We don't <laughs> right. have any letters against it. So and we do have a picture of what it looks like on the package. It's a yes, beautiful mm -hmm. structure. Thank you. But uh, like I said, uh, I, the, their, uh, I shouldn't say, but uh, you know, frame inspector came out there, out there three times. Mm -hmm. One of them, Sam Ryder, came out there twice. He didn't say a word about it being too tall. Mm -hmm. And that was before I put the roof on it. And then and, it was different. Well, the final inspector, frame inspector came out too, and that was before the roof was on there. And he, he didn't say anything about so it. So when did you figure out it was too tall? When they came, when I applied for my final inspection, uh, and he didn't even get out of the car. He said, that's too tall. <laughs> he knew it. He was looking at it. <laughs> and I said, well, why didn't any other inspector say? He says, I don't know, but it's too tall. <laughs> so you're in front of us to keep it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, questions for the applicant? Have any of your neighbors complained about it being, uh, cutting off their view or causing any problem at all? No, ma'am. If, if, I don't know if we, John, John, John Michael, we have any letters of opposition or? Zero. And no one here. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? No, sir. We're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, it's unusual that no one is complaining and... and well, that's a beautiful structure. It is pretty. If you do your homework, I mean, it's two feet, so... Well, and we have not heard from the council member, so we mm -hmm. assume that there's no objection yep. there. So does anyone have a motion? I move we approve it. And I'd like to second it. Okay. Motion has been made and properly seconded. 
Any more discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Congratulations, your wait time here was well worth it, and I know you're very relieved, so yes, sir. thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case before the board is 2017-164. This involves the property at 4212 Brush Hill Road, also in Council District Number 7, home of Councilmember Anthony Davis. Uh, Lila Hall is the appellant and co-owner of the property at that address. The request is for a variance from height requirements in order to construct a detached garage. Subject property shown here in the zoning map maps up to the river just across the river from another case you heard earlier today. It's an RS-20 zoning district. The aerial view pointing back kind of from the street view of the subject property shows the back area where the property would be, where the uh, detached garage would be constructed. Site plan submitted uh, includes a number of renderings in your packet. This is the short version that we've included here to show some of the detail with regard to the detached structure. From my recent site visit, frankly, not great photographs of the rear of the property given the distance up to the front of the house, but a view up and down the street and across the street as well in this residentially zoned neighborhood. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Seeing no one, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation for the variance to so, the board. Please so introduce John yourself Michael, by name you and address. That picture with the river up again. So the garage is going to be built on the rear closer to the river? Is it going to be built on the rear closest to the river? Hi, um, I'm yes. Lila Hall, mm -hmm. and I'm the owner. This is my husband, Linus. And your address? 4212 Brush Hill Road. Okay. Um, yes, it is going to be built to the rear of the home. Um, kind of closer, toward, closer to the river. Toward the river, okay. correct. Did we get any letters of opposition from the General Jackson showboat or anybody? <laughs> no? Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. So um, you mentioned um, in, the, in your application, this is in a lower area of the property. It slopes down a little, or is it slightly below grade? Yes, and forgive me for my yes. inability with this thing. Um, yes, so the whole lot is on a slope. So the, um, the street, which is, there's a large yard, is um, several feet. Uh, below where the house is, and the carport level is several feet below the house or the okay. main floor of the house. So um, we did a major renovation, which we ended in 2015 um, in an effort to upgrade the home but keep its architectural uniqueness. Um, and in doing so, we um, intended to build this or a, a garage, and we dug back and. Um, back behind and adjacent to the house from what was an existing carport. Um, and so it's about five feet lower um, than the grade. Um, and we would like to build um, this garage and also a studio space above it um, for uh, our family to share as an artist studio, a music studio, and then some storage space above that. And our effort is to try to be um, consistent with the roof line of the existing um, home and the, the pitch of the roof on the existing house is 51. It's quite steep. I feel that the, the yard is quite a hardship in the sense that the slope is ex excessive um, and that is why we designed it as we did the, the proposed structure. I have additional photographs um, that I took and I'll have to forgive um, the dog sort of photo bombed most of them. <laughs> John Michael. Oh. <clears throat> What, what, what's driving the height limitation? Is it because it's detached? I mean, uh, if, if this were attached, wouldn't the height limit be the height of the house? I believe that's right. I didn't even look at that question, but I believe that's correct because it is just part of the house, therefore part of the normal it's, structure. It detached like we, is where you get the accessory structure yes. with different numbers. So once it becomes an accessory structure, it kind of gets its own sort of rules. Exactly. Okay. Precisely. Yeah, as, as we were going through the, uh, the plans review process, uh, uh, Richard Tomophilus did point out that all you need to do is make this an attached structure. And, and then you, you wouldn't be in front of us. Requirement. 
And if you look at the way, the, the part of this house that we really love is the side porch on the left mm -hmm. there. Right. Uh, we get a great breeze through there. We spend a lot of time as a family out there. And making an enclosed attachment, would basically close off that porch and join it to the house. And yes, that would satisfy the requirements, but I think it would you know, really change the, the, the structure of the house, you know, strange the, char the character well, of the house. Yeah. I wanted to point that out because it, it, it is one of the quirks of there's all sort of unintended consequences a lot of times with these codes that, you know, word attached, you get a different standard. Okay, so we have a letter here uh, from your neighbors on 4213 Brush Hill Road that they have no objection to this. And we even have a letter from your council person, Anthony Davis, that other brewer, you know, who was, who was here first. Our competition next. Yes. yes, our competition. Your competition, competition. says <laughs> that basically they support you too. So, yes. um, very good. Um, anything else to add? Thank you for sitting, sitting through our long meeting. And Any don't questions? forget that Vice Mayor Briley supports that. Oh, that's right. You know, how can I forget? So Vice Mayor Briley, I think, is his first appearance in front of the BZA since he's been Vice Mayor, says that um, he has no objection. So. Uh, and supports it, not support, no objection. So any questions for the applicant? Okay. Mr. Chairman, there was one very late submitted letter of mild objection with regard to the power lines or something. As you'll note, that was at 11.41 a.m. this morning. It only feels fair to acknowledge it on the record. Okay, so we do have a letter, an email that was submitted here 11.41, less than an hour and a half before our meeting from somebody, Russ Ward, who basically had an issue with the power lines. Um, yes, he is our neighbor four, three houses, three houses mm -hmm. to the north. Um, yes. We don't know him well. We did, did not specifically speak to him. It was a letter sent to him as per um, the parameters of this appeal. Um, we did not reach out to him. We reached out to our neighbors who would be most impacted. Sure, right. So uh, both neighbors on the sides. Yeah, well, we just got this literally less than an hour and a half before our meeting, so John Michael has um, bought this the story. The power lines do run along the uh, ridge. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an easement already for NES to, to get to them. Okay. Um, and it's not part of where we'd be building. Very good. Uh, anything else to add? I don't think so. Uh, anything else? It is, um, it is not just five o'clock somewhere. It is five o'clock here, and we've been here for a long time. So we are going to close the public hearing and discuss this case. Discussion. I like it. There you go. So you well, want a motion to, I like it, doesn't legally let him build. <laughs> I move that we approve it. And do you want to state the hardship as the, uh, Topography. He says the t hardship being the topography. Do you agree to that? Sure. Okay. Then I'll second. Okay. We have a motion. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for waiting so long. John Michael. The final case set for today's agenda that's not already been addressed is case number 2017-166. Helene L. Harvey, the appellant, and Leslie Mondelli, owner of the property, located at 7484 Charlotte Pike. The request before the board is for a special exception to use an existing residence and property for a class one daycare center. It's been referred to the board as a special exception case under 17.16.035A. The area of view here shows you the heavily wooded area that's at issue. The street that you see in the lower right hand portion of the picture is Charlotte. This gives you some idea of the orientation of that subject property to the major roadway. As you'll see from the prior photo, there's no direct access to the subject property. However, there are um, some paved roads along Hewland Hollow Road that do eventually work their way back to the property um, by hook or by crook. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout and utilization of the property. There are a number of other uh, items submitted in the board's packets. We just use the overview items here in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Here showing the access that would be obtained off of Charlotte, which again would be just to the right of the representation shown here. The layout of the structure itself. 
and a closer uh, detail on the excess from Charlotte Pike. So anyone here? No, there's no one here, period. Uh, there's no one here in opposition to this case, uh, Mr. Chairman. Casper's back there. Are you sure? I don't see anyone. <laughs> that said, uh, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. We encourage you to introduce yourself by name and address and address board accordingly with regard to this special exception request. Uh, good afternoon, or should I say good evening? Mm -hmm. um, we uh, are here, though I'm Al Harvey. Um, I live at 939 Rodney Drive. This is John Tassell, and this is not Leslie Mondelli. Um, this is Larry Curtis from the First United Pentecostal Church who have purchased the property from the Mondellis, and we would be renting from the church. So we are here on behalf of the children and the parents and the teachers of A New Leaf. We are a daycare center and we are currently located at St. David's Episcopal Church. We have been serving families for 12 years and we are licensed by DHS. <coughs> Excuse me. We are also supported by the Tennessee Regio Study Group to offer um, project-based learning and nature education for young children. Our contract with St. David's is expiring in a month and we must relocate. And we have been looking for a space to go for several t um, months and we have uh, thought um, of several properties that were in the area approach owners and that's how we met the First United Pentecostal Church. And at the time, they didn't know this, but uh, several months later, they, uh, recent, they had acquired, they were offered to buy the Mondelli property. And that's when they called us up and said, are you still looking? And we said, yes. And so they offered that we rent the property from them. So there has been a lot of confusion because of this uh, as to which property we're talking about. Uh, it is 7484 Charlotte Pike, but also, um, According to Bonnie Crombie, it became 7520 Charlotte Pike, uh, and people uh, initially thought we were talking about a property behind the West Chase neighborhood, but it is actually behind a church and owned by the church. So we are uh, requesting a special exception to operate our daycare center because it is zoned residential. And we are applying for a class one, which is the smallest class between 13 and 25 children. And we meet the three requirements. The first being a minimum of a half an acre. And we have access to 33 acres. The street standard is an access um, through the church entrance. Uh, on Charlotte Pike, so we have two access through the church and then one access through Union Hollow. Uh, we have a landscape buffer A and a lot of vegetation all around, which is really a magical, healthy place for early childhood education. The immediate neighbors are all in favor. Uh, Marjorie Grizzard, Erica Adkins, and Donald Smith spoke with me and told me they were in favor. The first two came to the open house, and Marjorie lives at 7534 Charlotte Pike, and she represented all of her uh, siblings and children who live all around this area, and she said she was in favor. Erica Adkins live up at the top, um, and she has a three-year-old daughter who would benefit from our program, so she was also in favor. And Donald Smith saw no um, issues with his use of his property. So we already had a DHS visit. We have a building plans review that have been approved. We've had Metro and State Fire Marshal come for visits, and they only saw some minor things that we can quickly address. There are two fire hydrants that are very close to the house, so very easy access for fire trucks. The property is divided between two council members, uh, Dave Rosenberg, has heard no opposition and he is in favor. And Cherie Wiener, on the other half, had heard concerns from uh, the West Chase neighbors. Uh, and they came to the open house and that's how they find out that the property was not the one behind the West Chase neighborhood as they first had thought, but behind the church. And so we will not be going through the West Chase neighborhood to get to the property, and therefore there will not be a traffic impact on the West Chase neighbors. 
Um, also, because we are small, there won't be much of a traffic impact on Charlotte Pike. And so we're hoping that the benefits of our presence will be uh, outweigh the concerns of the neighbors um, and um, be permitted. Thank you, and John will address some uh, issues. Yes, thank you. Um, my name's John Tissell. Uh, I'm an architect uh, working with the, uh, the appellate here. Um, my address is 405 Fairfax Avenue. Um, on the site plan um, that you can see there, um, as Ella has mentioned, the primary access for this property and parking and everything else on a day-to-day -day basis will be through the First United Pentecostal Church parking lot. It, as it works out, you can see the one part of their parking lot almost almost meets the subject property exactly. And so access will be off of Charlotte, loop around the parking lot, which during the, the week is pretty much empty. Um, the church has dedicated a certain part of that for, for teachers to park in, and there'll be a little walkway leading right over to the, to the uh, place where the where the, the daycare will be. So that will be the day-to-day -day access. There'll really be no need to even use the driveway that leads directly to the property, although that will, of course, be available for emergency access or things like that, but it, it won't be needed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that, that's very important because the, the concerns that, that any have come up from neighbors or council or anything else has been about access, traffic, and so forth on that driveway, and it really will not be a day-to-day -day issue. Um, <clears throat> There's also been some di some discussion about uh, the long-term plan here and the rural maintenance policy and so forth, and just want to uh, to address that uh, in that this this use will really support the rural maintenance policy in that what the daycare is proposing here is to not change the property really in any significant way to keep it rural to use it as a rural property not to expand roadways, sewers, anything else. Um, you know, by right, the owner could build 18 single family houses on this without any kind of variance or anything else. And so this is a much less intensive use. Um, and uh, the, uh, as Elle mentioned, the, the proposed uh, site does meet all the conditions for a special exception. The, although the driveway would not be used on a day-to-day -day basis, it does have access to a, a collector street. And in practical terms, the church parking lot obviously has direct access to Charlotte. So thank you. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? I believe you have an updated map that um, was included in the packet. So whose district is this really in? Well, I think Cherie Wiener mm -hmm. has the church and the front, and then Dave Rosenberg has the back. So where's the daycare located? So it will be in Cherie Wiener's. Okay. And when so you, she sent her... Um, so you know why Fort Campbell is in Kentucky, not in Tennessee? Because it straddles both states. Mm -hmm. The post office is in Kentucky. So, <clears throat> any questions of the applicant? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Seems that they answer the questions about safety that were um, questioned. So thank you for presenting that. And the access you were satisfied yeah. with. Okay. Unlike some of our other daycare centers, as you heard the case we deferred earlier, it was in a very residential neighborhood and people had concerns about that, obviously. This is a different kind of setting. If there's no more discussion, I'll make a motion. Okay. To approve the. Mr. Request. Chairman, forgive the awful timing of my commentary. I want to make sure the board does have correspondence from both Council Member Weiner and Council Member Rosenberg. I know that Council Member Weiner had originally submitted an email, which is included in your packet, but also more recently a letter dated today's date, July 6, 2017, addressed to each of you individually, actually, on this board. Um, 
because it was received so late in the day, I don't know if you have that or not. I have exactly one cap copy, which I'm happy to distribute to you. Uh, Council Rosenberg's email was um, dated last night at 8 p.m. You do have the letter from mm -hmm. um, Council Member Weiner as well? Very well. Just wanted to make sure you had it and had seen those because we always like to give a certain deference to correspondence from our uh, council members. Mm -hmm. I need to redo the motion. <laughs> motion this, to this approve. Let's start, start to motion to approve. Okay. The special Chairman. exception request. <laughs> um, so I talked to Council Lady Weiner this morning about it, and she just expressed um, real concern about the access. And it's not that she was opposed to it, she just felt like she needed more information regarding the, the, that she had a number of questions regarding the access, which I really couldn't answer for her. Um, she had concerns about the, um, the neighborhood meeting. Um, she said that um, that it was uh, it was a, a community meeting, if you would, but it wasn't sponsored by either herself as the council person or by Councilman Rosenberg, and she felt like that she had not had the opportunity to 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 vet that out, and she had just many questions regarding the access. Again, she was not opposed to it per se, but she was Did really she? asking for some additional time to try to get more information. Okay, she wanted additional time, so therefore did she want it deferred? Um, yes, I think so. I think she wanted, I think she was asking for a one meeting deferral so she could get more information. Okay, that wasn't clear in her letter, so okay, I'm well, sure I, we would have honored that if we had read it in her letter. She, um, we can still she made that pretty, pretty well, clear to me as well. I think of course, we can still honor it. I just yeah. wasn't aware of it until okay. you brought it up. So, um, do we want to try again? So we will get, get rid of your motion. Okay, so more discussion about this. So as we can said earlier, we this is a weird say situation. Anything? Sure, okay. Um, so she came to the meeting and talked to the neighbors and talked to us. And I've reached out to both of them many times saying, you know, are, are we organizing this? Are we going to come? And then when she sent that letter uh, to to you uh, on June 19th, it's quite obvious that she is referring to the property at 7498 Charlotte Pike, which is the one behind the West Chase neighborhood. So there was confusion by her and by, therefore, the whole West Chase neighborhood about where the location of this was, um, hence all yeah. of her access. Normally, Concerns. when a council person, and I, I imagine, could she not be at the meeting today? That, that was her concern. That's why she contacted me initially was, is that she really wanted to be here, okay. but she was, had a very close friend that was having surgery okay. today, and she just could not be here. Board members, as you know, normally, um, if a council person requests a deferral, we usually honor that. Um, Bill, I want to ask you, did she come out and say she wanted a deferral? Yes, she did. And so in response to that, I picked up the phone and called Councilman Rosenberg and I asked him if he would object to a one meeting deferral based upon Council Lady Weiner's request. And he said that he had no objection to that. Okay. She just didn't make that clear in the letters why I was asking right. you. Understood. Okay. Can I ask one question? I'm sorry, if, if, if it's not out of order. Um, just given the schedule that the owner is working on, is it possible to also to sort of say, if, if we, we would be happy to say, give her any additional information she needs about access or anything else, if that's a condition on approval, um, just as a way to not delay the owner's plans. I'm just raising the question. You know, she's the council person, mm -hmm. and so like I said, we, you know, if she right. asks for a deferral, that's kind of I where understand. we are. No, I, I, just I just feel two, we've had weeks, weeks to address the questions, oh, and, and they only come up at the very last minute. It's it's difficult to address but them. For two weeks, um, and if she asks for it, I think that's a reasonable request. What are board members think? I feel, well, usually I would agree. But she was very clear in her 
questions, so I feel that we, if they would answer her questions on publicly now, perhaps that would be good enough. But, and we didn't know from her letter that was her intent. And, yeah. I but mean, I, I, mean, I will go with whatever the, the board. Contacting the administrator and asking for a deferral, I mean, that's good enough. I know, right? but we didn't know until know. they sat through I know. five, right. I mean, four right. hours. Honestly, if, if we had known yesterday, we could have sat down with her at any time and worked out all these questions. I mean, it's it's just hard at the very last minute. And she came to the open house, and we mm -hmm. talked about things there, and she didn't indicate that she would defer. I, I asked her, I said, will you be at, Be at, at the BZN? And she said, no, I won't be. She didn't say, and I will ask for a referral, uh, I mean, a deferral. Well, I think so many of the questions that she raised have been addressed, like a confusion about where the location is, for instance, and the access and, uh, to the property. So, so I think some questions have already been, and okay. I agree with Christina that if we have other questions that she has posed, that we should ask them right here and have them on the record. Mr. King, your opinion? I think we ought to honor the council person's request, deferred. We can get an approval <laughs> now, continue to want to speak. The approval from the council person. That's a little I don't iffy. Know how we work, I don't know how we word that. Um, board members? David needs I, you. I would, I'm actually okay taking action on it now. Uh, I feel like we've addressed everything. Now, I don't know that there's any new information to be had. No. Well, to me, you know, when a council person directly asks the zoning administrator for a deferral, I'm gonna lean toward being a deferred, but I guess they could still try to get four votes today, and if not, it's one of the kind of same thing as waiting, right? Sure. Well, if we defer, can we move it to the front of the docket board of the- John Michael. At or near. Okay. When, when's, what's the date? Next board date is Thursday, July 20th. It's two weeks. Uh, Two weeks should, it looks be, like that's two what weeks should be fine. Does that create a hardship for you in any way? Yes, but we'll do what we have to. That's, that's a very accommodating spirit, thank you. Well then I'll, I'll uh, do we need to close the public hearing? Yes, we, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, I'll move that we'll defer this till the next meeting. And it be near the first of the agenda and or as close first, to the first of the agenda as, as possible. possible. Yes. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor deferring this one meeting signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? No. no. <laughs> so the 3 2 vote means the motion does not pass. The board will need to take up another motion to determine whether or not to take formal action on the board hearing today or otherwise. The matter will stay open for its failure to get four affirmative votes on a motion and does, thus be heard at the next available date. Does anyone else have another motion? I'll go back to the motion I made originally okay. to approve the special exception request. Okay, motion been made. And I would be glad to second that. Properly seconded, any more discussion? So I, I'd like to point an order if, uh, if we come up 3-2 on this vote, it's... Deferred. It, well, it, it would be deferred so unless held someone, open. until it's someone... Basi it's basically held open. Someone could open. review it and add a vote to one side or the other. Yes, but they're... usually that vote does not take place till when, John Michael? The next board meeting, at which time it's convened and we can take such formal action. Right. Okay. I just want to clarify. Okay. We have a motion. It's been properly seconded. Any more discussion? No. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Three, two. Two weeks. John Although Michael. the board could go through the seemingly fruitless exercise of contemplating a motion to deny, seemingly nobody interested in that today, no. this actually means that the uh, case stays open for 30 days. It would be heard uh, at our next BCA meeting on July the 20th. Members not in attendance today, namely Mr. Taylor and Ms. Chapel, would have the opportunity to review the case and cast their vote at the beginning of the meeting if they, in fact, reviewed the case. We would record the votes at that time, and if it pushes the motion, uh, the last 
last motion, I think, was for approval. Yep. They could place a vote on that motion, probably renew the motion at that date. Just and also members say. can change their vote if they want to. could, theoretically, if they reconsider certain aspects of the case, they could do so. Okay. But the case will be open until July the 20th and at or near the top of the docket on that date. Okay. We're done. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.